Okay, recording has started. So <clears throat> just a little intro here. Um, this is what essentially what we're going to be talking about today. The Mayfly data logger, programming that, incorporating it into the uh, Mayfly Enviro DIY monitoring kits that you um, received, adding the CTD sensor to that. And then at some point, you're going to get to, you're going to be installing the stations outside and you'll turn them on and the data will be sending to monitor my watershed um, in real time. Okay, so just, um, just to address the idea here that this really is an experiment. This is an entirely new workshop for us. Um, regardless of this whole online situation. This was gonna be a new workshop anyways. Um, and on top of that, it's online. So this is really a new process to everyone involved, us Stroud folks, as well as all of you. Um, so that said, we will adjust as needed. Um, you know, we're, we have a good schedule and we've prepared quite a bit, so it seems like it should go smoothly, but we just really don't know. So we will adjust accordingly and no one needs to stress about it. Um, so as I mentioned, just minimizing, we all should just uh, be, be cognizant of movement on camera and keeping our audios uh, muted when we're not speaking. Um, again, even though some folks are not assembling kits, please, those who aren't assembling kits, try to stay away from multitasking and just stay focused on the workshop. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, just in preparation for what Shannon's gonna be getting into, um, it's probably gonna be best to close out all docs and web pages that are currently on your computer that don't apply to the workshop um, because Shannon is really gonna be having you guys accessing different sites and different documents. So it'll probably be best to just have all uh, superfluous material um, off of your computer. Okay, so some introductions here. Shannon, the main feature today. She is teaching the course um, today. She is the uh, designer and engineer, electrical engineer at Stroud. This is Shannon here. Um, she is multi-talented. <laughs> In addition to juggling, she also is a concert level pianist. Um, Rachel is, uh, uh, has been assisting Shannon for several years now, um, and she is going to be assisting uh, in the teaching effort today. She is a research technician at Stroud. Um, this is Rachel here. Um, that's me there. I am moderating today, and I do citizen science at Stroud. Tara Menz is um, gonna be kind of monitoring the workshop today from an educational perspective. She is the assistant director at Stroud, uh, assistant director of education at Stroud, excuse me. Um, the, and there's Tara right there. And the assistant director at Stroud is Scott Henson. And he is going to just kind of be observing. Uh, as we mentioned, this is a new process, and so Scott has been heavily involved in the development of Enviro DIY. So um, he's kind of just going to be helping out today and just um, using this as a lead into a lot more Enviro DIY stuff going forward. Um, so the attendees today, I've got them organized by group here. So we've got a big group from the Deer Park Rural Alliance, um, Zach Mar Marlsberg, Bob Major. Bob and Matt are working together as a team here from Deer Park. Matt was not able to be here today because of a personal matter. They will be assembling a kit. Zach will also be assembling a kit. John is on the call today. He's not going to be assembling a kit. Grace is leading the Deer Park folks. She's sort of just observing and kind of taking it all in today. Um, Al is also a leader with the Deer Park folks. And um, Tiffany has the third kit from the Deer Park um, group. So that's the Deer Park folks that we have here. All the Deer Park um, group are part of the um, Poconos Kittatinny cluster in the Delaware River Watershed Initiative. Um, <clears throat> Paul Wilson and uh, Michelle 
Jones Wilson are uh, both with East Stroudsburg University, both professors there, um, and they are working with uh, two of their students, Levi Morris and Ben Laubach. Um, they both also work in the DRWI context um, in the Poconos Kittatinny cluster. Then we've got Michelle de Blasio, who is with the Nature Conservancy in New Jersey. Um, she is part of the New Jersey Highlands Cluster in the Delaware River Watershed Initiative, and Rob Tuttle with White Clay Watershed Association. Um, okay, so I've mentioned the Delaware River Watershed already, Watershed Initiative already. Um, that is how we are that, that is how all of you folks um, were able to attend this workshop without a fee. We were able to waive the fee um, because um, all of you folks are within the Delaware um, watershed and are working within the context of the Delaware River Watershed Initiative. That initiative is a William Penn Foundation funded effort. Um, we have deployed a lot of these stations across the basin um, in association with that project, but there's also quite a few stations out that are um, that have been deployed simply by independently by groups and individuals as well. Okay, so um, just moving on to the more of the content of the workshop. What are we going to be doing here? Well, essentially, we are programming a Mayfly data logger and assembling an Enviro DIY sensor station that collects continuous data and sends it to monitor my watershed. So this is the kit that we're assembling with the Mayfly board, building the station here, putting it out into the wild, and then it collects data and sends it to monitor my watershed. A little bit more of a close up, here we have the Mayfly board. This is a Shannon Hicks invention. She designed this and continues to um, to uh, um, develop it according to um, just technological needs. Um, and then this is a close up of the uh, stations we're building. Um, we, Shannon set up the, you've probably seen Shannon set up the boxes so that a turbidity sensor can be included later. But as you know, today we're just, today and tomorrow we're just talking about the CTV sensor. Um, so after, to, after uh, today and tomorrow um, is when you all will install the station. So you'll leave the workshop, hopefully, with a functional station that just needs to be put out in the wild and then turned on. So you'll be putting it out on the stream, acquiring the proper installation supplies and putting it out in the stream and then starting to log data. Um, whether we do a, a formal workshop to train you all on installation and as well as maintenance and quality control of the stations, we're kind of going to be deciding that, I think, according to how this workshop goes and how confident folks are in the installation process um, after the workshop. Okay, so here's our agenda. Here's our simple agenda. You all have this, um, should have this in front of you. We ask everyone to do the pre-session tasks of creating an EnviroDIY.org account and installing the Arduino IDE in advance. And it appears as if everyone has done that at this point. So we had a good success on that. Um, today, there's going to be some computer prep stuff as well as just introductory materials from Shannon. Um, we'll have an hour and a half lunch. We will take uh, questions at lunch for 15 minutes. Session two is going to be setting up the online stuff, monitor my watershed setup. And then tomorrow we're going to be actually working with the Mayfly data logger. And then finally, at the end of tomorrow, at the, in the afternoon tomorrow, we will be actually assembling the monitoring kit. And as I mentioned, additional sessions will be uh, determined later. Okay. Um, so you should also all have this de detailed agenda. You should definitely have that um, available to you uh, just so that you have these links available. Um, we're also going to be pasting the links into the chat box, but definitely have this detailed agenda handy so that, you, so that the links are available. 
each session is going to be broken up into different lessons um, and um, that's uh, our description of the lessons. So hopefully folks have reviewed this in advance. I'm not going to go through this in detail because I think we want to just let Shannon get at it here. Um, day two as well, there's links there. So both days, please have this detailed agenda handy. Um, so what you've done already, uh, you registered for the workshop, you purchased your monitoring kits, you purchased the Hydrus 21 CTD sensors from Meter Group, completed the pre-session steps of establishing an Enviro DIY account, downloading Arduino IDE. You received the monitoring kits that included station uh, parts as well as support documents. And luckily we did receive all the CTD sensors. There were some major issues with um, FedEx delivery, but um, Paul really hammered it out and got it done for the Deer Park uh, and ESU folks. So thanks Paul and Grace for really being deliberate and um, just pushing that through. Um, and then we also did participate in some Zoom practice sessions up to, up to today. So just a little more review. Um, this is the kits. You have this in your one, uh, one of your support documents. So you have that handy to reference through the workshop. Keep that handy. Um, this is what you actually received. This is a nice photo that Zach took for us. Um, <clears throat> There were a few parts in there that were not included. They're not included in the list. Um, Shannon will get into, uh, will describe those at the appropriate time. Here are the documents that you have, um, that you should have up and ready to, uh, to use just in case and for your own reference. As I mentioned, this detailed agenda has all of your links for today and tomorrow, so definitely keep that handy. Um, here's the Hydros 21 CTD sensor. This is the setup you'll have at some point, most likely the turbidity sensor, as we mentioned, is not being incorporated today. There's just a little tutorial on conductivity. Um, those screws are where the conductivity is actually measured. Um, just to be clear, conductivity is simply a measure of how well the water conducts electricity. It's directly related to the concentration of dissolved ions in the water. Um, it's commonly used to screen for pollution, and it generally the general trend is that conductivity is higher in areas with human activity. Um, and it is uh, used as a coarse indicator of water quality. Okay, there's a lot of kind of subtlety to it, but basically conductivity is a good overall indicator of water quality. Temperature, everyone knows temperature. Here's where temperature sensor is, is kind of buried within the CTD sensor. Um, and then the pressure transducer, measuring water depth from this point to the surface of the water. So that's the pressure transducer right there. It's, it's a pretty sensitive ceramic disc um, that uh, measures water pressure and also compensates for atmospheric pressure. And Shannon will get into some of those details. It's very easy to break, so you have to be careful with that. Even when you're moving, even when you're working with your, your sensors in this workshop, be careful not to, not to you know, throw that thing on the ground or bang it against a you know, table or wall or something, because that, that uh, ceramic sensor is sensitive. Okay, so we're gonna be working uh, in, in the realm of Enviro DIY and monitor my watershed. These are two components of the Wiki Watershed Toolkit. Um, Enviro DIY is a bunch of do-it-yourself type stuff happening, people building these stations that we're talking about, but also a lot of different variations, different sensors, um, different approaches, different, different programming, et cetera. Um, Within Enviro DIY, this is the page which you're all familiar with. You have a log in at this point. Um, two things to really be aware of are the forum and the blog. Um, the forum is a is an area where anyone can post questions and get feedback from the group as well as directly from Stroud folks who are monitoring the forum forums. Uh, and then the blog. These are essentially just little stories, methods. Um, 
et cetera, from individuals that are interested. Um, we just took one from fellow Robert Sarnoski, who, who developed a simple temperature logger using Shannon's Enviro DIY Mayfly logger. Um, that's a good reference for just kind of getting some information on other things that folks are doing with these um, Mayfly boards and in the Enviro DIY context. Monitor my watershed, as we mentioned, is the portal uh, into which all of the data from these stations is being um, sent. We are setting the stations up in this workshop to send the data via self signal directly to the uh, portal. There's also um, an option to just upload data to, to the portal in which it would be online but not real time. So this is sort of the basic uh, map that you get with Monitor My Watershed when you click this Browse Sites tab. Um, when you click on one of these sites, it brings up a pop-up for that site, some basic information of the site. You'll then click this View Data for this site in order to get into the data. And then you'll get this uh, more detailed description and map of the particular site. And then you'll get access to all of the data graphically display, displayed as well as for um, direct raw data download. So this is what we're building. The station with the CTD sensor um, all being run by the Mayfly board. Uh, final slide, just a kind of a um, broader conceptual thing here. This is a product adoption curve that kind of just I think is applicable to our situation because this is a new um, product. This is a new program. Um, Enviro DIY has, has some years, um, but this process of, of introducing these stations to broader audiences outside of Stroud um, is really a, a, a new process. And we're really kind of in this region here right now. So um, you all can feel good about the fact that you are kind of at the cutting edge of this stuff and um, hopefully this workshop is the start to um, uh, building this workshop out and making this material more and more accessible to um, bigger audiences. Okay, so that's uh, what I have to say right now. Um, I think we are ready to go to Shannon, turn it over to Shannon and let her get into the meat of the workshop. So I'm going to stop share and turn it over to Shannon. All right, thanks Dave. Um, so yeah, my name is Shannon Hicks. I am the research engineer at Stroud. Um, we've been working on this Mayfly project for about five years. So um, I've given about 30 of these multi-day workshops in those last few years um, all around the country and even done some um, workshops internationally. Uh, so we've taught hundreds and hundreds of people how to do this, but we've always done it with our own laptops. That we had like a 16 laptops that we brought and we take them with us everywhere we go and we would uh, show up and hand you a Mayfly board and hand you a laptop that already has the software and everything's configured and you just plug it in. And then we spend all of our time talking about the uh, installation and the maintenance of the sensors and some of the science behind what's going on. That's been a little hard to do because we can't always drive to places with laptops to teach people. So we've been looking at a way to do this remotely or to do it with you know people showing up with their own laptops at a workshop, but it's always been a bit of a challenge to try to figure that part out. So uh, now that we've got the challenge of all working home from home and working remotely and not doing this workshop in person, we decided that we would use this opportunity to test out our um, uh, the, uh, the the new curriculum here for getting everyone to install this stuff on their own machines. The good point about this is that if if this works, then you'll be able to build as many of these things as you want. Even when people came to our office and used our laptop, they left knowing how to build this, but they only knew how to build it using our laptop. So there was still that learning curve that they would have to go home and do this portion by themselves. So uh, we're, we're hoping that this goes smoothly and you guys will be able to uh, uh, install all the software and do this um, the next couple of days 
uh, quickly and easily enough that you could do this again later without our um, uh, intervention. So um, that being said, uh, we do appreciate everybody uh, installing the, and downloading the software ahead of time. That's one of the big time consuming parts because uh, the software is kind of large and then um, uh, depending on your, your internet speed and then um, it takes a while to download and then once you've clicked on it, you have to install it and there's drivers and it does take a little while. And so we didn't want to take up time um, doing that during this workshop. So we appreciate everybody having that software ready. So um, I'm using three different laptops here. Um, I've got one that I've got um, kind of as a backup that's got uh, the chat window so I can see some of the chat comments or questions. I've got another laptop that's got all of your video screens um, open in a big gallery so I can see everybody. And then I have another brand new laptop uh, that's one of our workshop ones that has no drivers installed or anything else. So it's going to be bare and uh, simple and basically brand new, just like what yours looks like. So I'm going to share that screen and you're going to work with me as I go through all the download steps and the configuration steps. So we'll do them all together. Um, so I'll be doing that on this screen, but if, if you do, uh, I'll be able to see you guys on the other screen and the chat windows and all that. So I hopefully I'll be able to keep an eye on everybody's uh, progress. So if anybody's having trouble, you can uh, type in the chat window or use the raise hand feature and we'll slow down or um, uh, there are times where I'm gonna say, okay, did everybody get that? If you could give me like a thumbs up or you can also do a like a thumb up in the, uh, uh, in the chat box. For me, the quickest thing is if you just put your finger up on the camera and hold it for a second or two, give me time to look at the, my, my camera off screen, don't just give me a, a half a second. Like Bob's holding a nice good thumbs up there for a good long time. So thank you, Bob. Um, so if you give me a good thumbs up and I know, okay, everybody's at this step because I really don't want to skip two or three or four steps ahead and then find out that uh, everybody's still stuck, you know, on the content from 10 minutes ago. So um, when we're doing this in a workshop in a classroom, it's easy for me to walk around the room and see if everybody has had success or not. And if all I see is a very small little grainy picture uh, of somebody who's kind of grimacing at their screen and, and uh, pulling their hair out, I'm not going to know whether that's good or bad. So the, the more feedback you can give me visually or in the text box of whether, yeah, this is working or holy cow, this is a train wreck and I, I can't get this thing to work at all, then we'll, um, we'll try to help you. If there's a, somebody who's having some real trouble and you're really getting behind and uh, we don't want to stop the whole room to, um, to address that person or even if there's two people, uh, Rachel, who is, um, has done this a bunch and has helped out with pretty much all of our workshops the last couple of years, will jump with you into what's called a breakout room, which is where you'll leave this room with the main session with everyone, and uh, you'll go into your own kind of Zoom meeting with her, and she'll help troubleshoot you there. You could like share your screen with her, and she can walk you through and maybe get you straightened out, and then once you've um, got the everything back to where you think you're ready to join the room again, you guys can come back in here and we'll try not to get too far ahead if we see some people jump out. So if you have some trouble uh, and you need some help, you can uh, use the chat box and Rachel will probably uh, be able to help you by um, uh, um, using one of those breakout rooms. So I see that Grace has her hand up. Grace, do you have a question? Oh, this other thing is after you've, uh, so you're muted right now, so you'll have to. Got it, got it, I got it. Um, uh, this is for, for David. Um, uh, Tiffany uh, still doesn't seem to be on, and I'm wondering if um, to allow her to launch into the, the room, maybe there is some sort of switching thing that isn't allowing her to get in. Grace um, Tiffany is on. She just doesn't have her video on, but she can hear what we're saying. Okay, I will text her to turn her video on. She's been on it a lot for her exam, so I think, uh, all right, I will do that. Thank you. Tiffany, would you mind just turning your video on, like right now, so that we can confirm that it's working? While we're waiting for that, I will say I was part of a, um, a four-day Zoom training session a couple of weeks ago. It was four eight-hour days of Zoom calls, like nonstop from nine to five every day. 
And that was exhausting at the end of the first day. So I know what it's like to be trying to be um, uh, on a video call, trying to learn some technology and it, it, it's, it's mentally challenging. It, it's, it's harder than you'd think just to sit here and watch people and participate in an online kind of workshop. If, if we've been doing a lot of Zoom stuff internally, just developing this workshop for the last few months and also just some of our other meetings and those get pretty um, uh, tiring after a while. And so I really appreciate your patience today while we're, this would be hard enough to do in a room uh, with everyone sitting there in person um, because of all the, the downloading that we're gonna have to do and switching back and forth between uh, web browsers and software. So I really appreciate um, everybody's patience as we go through this because it, it is gonna be hard. Um, and I'm gonna try to go as slow as I can, but we do have a lot of content to go through. So we're gonna, we've kind of set this up so that we get the most important stuff done first. And then we will, um, if, when we have more time at the end, we can add plenty of material at the end, but we're kind of doing it in the order in which uh, we really need things to be done in. So I see Tiffany's on and it looks like Jen's on too. So we appreciate you guys having cameras on while we work on this session. Um, Tiffany's one of the ones who did receive a uh, station in the mail the other day. So um, we won't be using any of the actual materials. You guys got the little box with all the, the goodies in it and everything. We won't need any of that. Um, Right now, we might need the Mayfly in a little bit if we're making good progress, probably not. We might have time this afternoon after lunch to plug in the Mayfly, but right now for the next hour, we're gonna talk about how to tell your laptop what uh, EnviroDIY Mayfly data logger board is. As Dave said, I invented this, so nobody else in the world knows how to talk to this with a computer other than the people here at the Stroud Center because we wrote this, the kind of code it's gonna tell your computer what this board is and how you need to be able to talk to it. So uh, if you download, hopefully everybody already has that Arduino software downloaded. Um, the name Arduino means, uh, it's, it's the name of uh, just an ecosystem of products. And uh, the people who developed it like 10 or so years ago were having uh, lunch at a bar in Italy where they all work. Uh, it was a bunch of like hackers and, and engineers and artists and people who decided they wanted to come up with a really easy to use electronics development platform. And the name of the restaurant that they met at was called the Arduino something something. It had that name in it. So they thought it was a cool name and they decided to name their platform after that bar or coffee shop or whatever it was. So that's that's the story behind the, the strange name there. But what it is, is it's a, it, the Arduino is, it, it, people refer to a, a little blue board. It says Arduino on it, looks like that. Have it upside down, there we go. This is what most people think of as an Arduino. If you go on the internet and you search that word, you're gonna get a lot of pictures of this little blue board. This is a very generic, simple board that costs like $20 and will do certain things, but it doesn't have any of the capability that we need for doing data logging and environmental monitoring. So I decided to build my own board that's got this plus a whole bunch of other cool features on it that we'll talk about later. Um, <clears throat> and the software that you download is ready to go. You can plug this, your store-bought Arduino right into your computer and you'll talk to it just fine. But if you plug in a Mayfly, the software doesn't know what it is. So we have to go in and tell the software uh, all we need to do um, to talk to it. So. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more about what the Arduino thing is in our usual workshop. We'll spend a half hour talking about that. We do a lot of background for people who want to know. Um, but for now, what we are going to do is um, I'm going to share my screen. And let's see. Do, do, do. All right. So I am looking at it over there so I know that it works. So I'm sharing my desktop. So this is gonna be a little bit hard because as you guys minimize your Zoom window in order to see your desktop to do this, my picture may go away or it may just, if you had it on full screen mode with chat and all the other things open, it might just go into like a little um, box up in your upper right hand corner. You can move that box around if you need to, um, if it's covering up something important. Uh, if you had it on full screen mode, you might have to escape out of that. If you had it in speaker mode, you might have to hit the escape button, and then that brings it back to a smaller window. Um, but you basically, you need to be able to see your desktop so that we can find that Arduino button 
that uh, usually when you install the software, it will put a shortcut on your desktop. If you chose not to do that, then you may have to go to the start menu and find that, but it'll be alphabetical, so it should be at the top of the list. So if everybody could, how, whatever method you need to do to get that going, you should click on it or double click on it to open up the Arduino program. And this takes uh, 15, 20 seconds or so for the software to actually start up. I think a few of you have probably already started it up after you installed it the other day because we had some questions about this window that pops up from a few people. So if you see on my screen, I have a blue and white window that says Sketch, Mayfly, Arduino, and it's got a bunch of computery languagey stuff on it. Um, I'm going to stop right there and make sure everybody has a window that looks like that on their screen. Make sure you're, this is the other fun part is that you're, you're doing on your computer what I'm doing on mine. So you're going to have a, something that looks kind of like my window and then your own window and you got to keep track of which uh, thing to click on. Um, <clears throat> is there anybody who's not getting their Arduino program to open? All right, so I'm assuming everybody's got that open then. So this is the Arduino IDE, and we refer to that in the manual and other places. IDE stands for the Interactive Development Environment. It's just a long computery word for the user interface that you type in in order to uh, program your Mayfly data logger. All of the code that you're gonna need for this workshop has already been written and we're gonna go download it. You don't have to learn code. You don't have to type anything other than just do the copy and paste kind of thing uh, because everything is already gonna be on your machine by the time we're done. So this is not a computer programming class. This is not a uh, learning how to solder with a bunch of uh, complicated electronics tools class. This is all just a trying to teach citizen scientists and other people who are interested in doing this themselves how to do it without a lot of complicated uh, tools and programming uh, required. So, all right. So we need to first go in here and set up some preferences for how this board is going to, or how the software is going to talk to your board. And if you click on file in the Arduino window, the next to the last thing on the list is preferences. And we need to click on that to open up the preference window for the Arduino IDE. This is the, one of the things that we do on all of our workshop laptops before, uh, on the, the laptops that we've given everybody in a, in a classroom. So this is the part that um, is really going to help teach your board or your laptop how to talk to the Mayfly. Um, there's a couple of default options that we want to change. Um, down here where there's some check boxes, we want to click on the box that says display line numbers because um, later on I might be referring to certain lines of code and it's much easier if we've all got that clicked so that um, we can refer to a certain line. So make sure that's clicked. There's also probably another button that might say check for updates on startup. I think that's probably checked by default. You should uncheck that, take the check off of that because uh, you're, if you have that checked, every time you start it up, you're going to get a bunch of warnings saying certain things are updated and we don't really need to worry about that right now. And that's just probably going to cause more issues than, um, than it would help. So once you've done that, you've clicked the display lines on and turned off the check for updates. There's one other thing that we need to do, but before we do that, I want you to go ahead and click OK to make sure those changes got saved in there. And we need to now go to a web browser to get a file. And this is the link. Um, I forgot to show you this last session um, slide here that we want to show you explaining what all we are doing in this particular session. Uh, intro to Arduino, we just kind of do that. Now we are, uh, we're downloading the Arduino configuration libraries. 
And the link that you can use to get there is in your agenda. Or you can also just go to envirodiy.org if you happen to have, if you want to just type that in from scratch. Um, and on our website, the EnviroDIY website, there is a, uh, a page that has, let's see, I do want to continue with that. Um, there is a page that has directions for how to do this step on your own. So if you had bought one of our uh, mayflies on Amazon, like a lot of people do, they follow these steps themselves and get this part of the software um, installed without being walked through. So on this website, envirodiy.org slash mayfly slash software, if you either follow the link that we sent you or you can just type it in manually, whatever is the quickest way for you to get there. If you scroll down here, we're on step two of the how to get the software to program to your mayfly. Um, there should be this little rectangular box that has a website address in it. It's a real long, complicated looking address. It, um, is, uh, I'll unhighlight it, but um, it's part A of step two of the instructions at the top of the page. This is the address that we need to copy from here and paste into that preferences tab in the Arduino software. So what everybody needs to do is just highlight this entire website address, HTTPS, all of that whole thing ending with JSON. It's gotta be that whole line. If any part of that line is missing, this is not gonna work. So when that's highlighted, then you can right click and say copy or control C. I believe some of you are on Mac um, and you'll have to use whatever the command is for copying a row of text on Mac. I can't remember, it's probably the squiggly thing and the C. Um, <clears throat> but whatever you need to do to copy that line so that we can type that in. Does everybody have And Bob has his hand up. Yeah, did you want to, I guess we'll ask Bob, did you, does, um, yeah, Bob, you can type your question in the chat, will probably be easiest, uh, unless it's a really complicated question and we got to talk about it here. Um, does everybody, can I get a thumbs up from everybody or did you find that URL on the website and copy it? All right, lots of thumbs. Doing good. Tiffany, did you find that okay? I'm having a little trouble right now. I'm trying to paste it in the, the URL. So, yeah. All right, Bob, what was your question? Are you, uh, I guess maybe you're texting. We'll have to unmute. And um, I, um, I, I overlapped, so I couldn't do anything. And I finally realized that you, your your screen is overlapping my screen. So yep. I finally I finally dropped it. But I'm now I'm I'm behind. I'm still on the uh, the sketch May a uh, Mayflower with thirteen. Um, uh, that first page with the void setup and the void loop. Yeah, we don't, we're not going to be doing anything with the code on that page. We're just doing something with the setup mode, which on, on a Mac, you're not, it's, it's going to be up in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. When, when, you're, when, you're, when you've clicked on the, the Mayfly, or excuse me, the Arduino window up in the upper left-hand side of your screen, you should have file and exit and sketch and tools and all that. If you go up there and go to file, you'll see the preferences menu there, I believe. Uh, Paul, are you using a Mac? I, yeah, I think. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember. I'm else. using a Mac. Yeah. Am I uh, correct? Uh, I remember I, I set this part up for you yesterday. I already, uh, it's already ready to go, the Arduino thing. The board manager, it's all ready to go. All right, so then, okay, well, that's great. Thanks, Zach. So, uh, Bob, if you can't get this part figured out, you don't need to because he's already got this step going, which is great. This is Fantastic. one of the, the, the harder time consuming parts. But okay, so for everybody else, now we go back into that preferences tab 
And if you click in where it says additional board managers, now you can, uh, I didn't actually copy it earlier, uh, copy. If you go into your, that board manager and then right click, it looks like right click doesn't work there. So you might have to just do control V to paste it in. But you have to paste that gigantic uh, URL into that window right there. And once you've done that, now you can just hit the okay button again. And it looks like nothing happens because really nothing really did happen. All we're doing is telling the Arduino program, hey, when it comes time to add a new board, you should go look at this address because I think there's some helpful information there. You can put more than one board manager uh, URL in that window. There's a little box you can click next to that. And if you happen to buy boards from other companies who do this same procedure, you'll need to, um, to grab their configuration files from there. <clears throat> Rachel, can you send John the text to that? Uh, the link to the to the uh, the page. So now, now that we've told the Arduino IDE where to get the configuration file, we have to install that. So go up to the Tools menu of this. And again, Bob, you shouldn't have to do this, but everybody else can go to Tools. And about halfway down on the menu, you see a thing. You've got our, our, and depending on what version of the Arduino program you have, I, I've got a kind of slightly older version here. Some of these menu options might be slightly different, but under the tools menu, you should have a thing that says board, colon, and then the name of a board. It might be uh, Arduino Genuino Uno, or it might be some other type of thing. What it is, is if you move your mouse over to the right, you get this menu that you can scroll and you see all the different boards that this software knows about. And you can see the, our, the Enviro DIY Mayfly is not in this list. So the very top of this board window, you can use your scrolly wheel to scroll up and down if you don't see it, but there should be a thing that says board manager dot dot dot. Anything with three dots on it means you click on that, it'll open up a, an, uh, another window. So if you click on that, that opens up this thing called the boards managers or boards manager. And let's see, does everybody get that? Um, this is where you turn on and off the ability for the Arduino program to talk to different types of boards. So what we need to do is find the one that we just entered. So we can type uh, in the search box if we want, but the easiest thing is you can go over here to the type and, and type contributed. And you'll see a list of uh, contributed boards that have been included with the software. And then down here, you see at the bottom of the list, Enviro DIY Mayfly board. Now I've already installed this, so I don't need to do this part, but for everybody else, um, you'll have an install button over here when you want you if you look at it nothing will happen you have to click on it and then you'll get an install button right so scroll down to where you see enviro diy at mega board by stroud water research center and if you've clicked on that over in the right hand corner you, you on your window you should see install if you have a remove button like bob probably does don't hit remove because we don't want to take it away so if you've already done this step maybe you guys are working ahead on your own you don't need to, to remove it and reinstall but if it says install, click on that, and then it will um, install the, I think if you go back here, you'll see that hit, click the install button and it will add it to your Arduino IDE. So it, it'll go download some stuff and you'll see like a progress bar going across. And then once you've done that, you can close that window out. And then when you go back to your tools board and you, scroll down the list of all the available boards. Sometimes it puts it at the very top of the list and other times it puts it at the bottom, but you should see Enviro DIY Mayfly 1284P listed as your board for being able to click on it. So you can go ahead and click that. And then once you've done that in the bottom right hand corner of your Mayfly window, I'll close the website and I'll close, uh, that too. So now I'm only showing you my um, Arduino IDE in the bottom right hand corner. You'll see in that little 
white and blue box, it should say Enviro DIY may fly 1284P on uh, at the bottom right hand corner of your Arduino IDE. So that is all of lesson one. At this point, I'm guessing a few of you maybe had some technical trouble and we need to back up and get everybody on the right page. If you're having a lot of real difficulty with this part, we can either stay on during lunchtime or do this afternoon after the session because we don't um, we don't really need this functionality for any of the other lessons later today. So if you're having some major, major trouble, we can reconvene later offline with just you and not the whole class to get this part working. But hopefully everybody went through this and got this going with no issues. <clears throat> So is everyone good to go at this point? Speak up if you have, are having any issues or raise your hand or signal in some way. Tiffany's good, Paul's good. That's great. So the good news is if we're all doing really great and we make it through the next lesson two before, um, which is some other on, online copying, you guys are doing good at copying and pasting. Sometimes this part is really hard because it, especially with, we're all navigating the Zoom windows and my window and the browser windows and the IDE window. I didn't want to jump into too much clicking and switching and moving back and forth and lose everybody. So we're going a little bit slow for this first session, but hopefully in the, um, the next couple of days um, or later today and then tomorrow, the next few lessons, we'll be able to go a little bit faster. Um, but if we get all of this done here in the next before 1130, we can, we can even try plugging the Mayfly in. I believe everybody, hopefully you saw the note that I put on every Mayfly box before I shipped it to you. There should have been a little uh, post-it that said, please don't plug this in. The reason for that is the drivers that the program needs to talk to it, if you don't do it just right, they don't get installed right, and then your computer will have a hard time recognizing the Mayfly when you really want to use it. So we got to make sure we've got all these you know, behind the scenes things going on uh, configured right before we plug in the Mayfly for the first time. So hopefully nobody plugged in their Mayfly ahead of time, because if you did, um, uh, and if it works, great, but I have had people who worked ahead and didn't have the drivers going right, and then they ended up having trouble uh, getting things to um, work properly later. So, all right, so since everybody seems to be doing great, we're going to do the next session, the next lesson um, part, which is um, <clears throat> on your agenda. Uh, there's a uh, some special drivers that, uh, and, and so first we told the software that's on your computer what a Mayfly is. So now the Arduino program knows what a Mayfly is. But we've also written hundreds of configuration files and sketches and examples, and they're called libraries. And those are the files that tell uh, the uh, Mayfly board what to do. So we've told the computer how to talk to a Mayfly. Now we need the files that tell a Mayfly how to talk to sensors and all that kind of stuff. And because those are, again, things that we wrote, you can't find them anywhere else, so we supply them. And we have them on a website called GitHub, G-I-T-H-U-B. And if any of you are programmers or done anything where you're uh, downloading software, especially if you're working with other people, GitHub is a um, online repository for programming and, and coding. And it's a really great method for writing software because everybody can contribute to it. And it keeps track of all of those changes and the different versions of the software. And it's just a great resource for um, online uh, collaboration of software. So you can see we've got 25 different repositories uh, and there's all sorts of uh, files and folders and it gets really confusing if you're not sure where you're looking. So there's a link, it should be in your agenda. If you happen to go to github.com slash EnviroDIY, that takes you to our main page with 25 separate uh, folders or repositories what we need, if you scroll down just a little bit, like the sixth or seventh one on the list is called libraries. And that's the file that we need because it's got all the Arduino libraries that you need to talk uh, to the sensors and everything that a Mayfly board needs. So if you click on that, 
that takes you to this website, github.com slash enviroDIY slash libraries. And that should be the URL that was in your agenda and is uh, in a couple other places. And this is the file that we've got to download and then put it on your computer. And then we got to do some like uh, clicking and dragging and putting it manually into the right folder so that your Arduino program can find it. So I assume I'm just kind of talking slow and rambling to give everybody time to click on all these. Um, remember, if you're trying to switch between windows um, and you're, you're on a PC, this doesn't apply to Mac, but if on a PC, if you want to go from uh, your uh, Arduino IDE to your web browser and back to the Zoom window, you can hold down the Alt button and hit Tab. And Alt Tab will switch between the different programs, or you can just kind of go down to your task manager bar at the bottom and click on them. But if you're just want to do a quick change, you can hold Alt. And as long as you hold Alt, you'll get a menu of all your programs and you can kind of click on which one you want. Um, so, uh, yeah. So if we go to, I got to move things around because my see in my case, my Zoom window is kind of covering up part of the screen. So if you scroll down on this libraries page, you get down here to about halfway down the page, you'll see a big uh, thing called README. Uh, that's the, the description that we've written to talk about these files. This is right in here, there's this thing that says link. It's got some little text uh, ASCII arrow things pointing to it. That's the button that you need to click to download the libraries for this file. There's other download buttons on this page and they don't actually work properly because they download links to the libraries and not the actual files themselves. So this is the button you need to click. So if you click on that link right there, I think you can see my, I'll highlight it even. This looks like my connection is maybe a little slow. Right there where it says link, that's the file you got to click on. So click on that and your uh, web browser will probably download it. It might have a window that pops up and says, what do you want to do with this file? You click save as, save as a file somewhere on your computer that you're going to know where it is, either the desktop or in my case, see it's downloaded. It says over here in the bottom left-hand side of my browser, um, it's downloaded. So if I go to the list of all of my downloads, which on Windows is, uh, I think there's a, in the, my PC under the user, there's a directory called downloads where everything you've ever downloaded is in there. We should be able to go into there and find that file. So there it is, libraries.zip. All right, so that is a zipped file that contains hundreds of smaller libraries. I'm going to take and go drag that into the uh, onto the desktop just to make it a little bit easier for me to work with. <clears throat> and if you happen to click on that library's zip file, it's going to open it up and you're going to see another file called libraries, but that one is now unzipped. And then you click on that and that's where you actually see all of those Library. So there's 36 separate items in there. It looks like I think 33 folders and three text files. So hopefully all of you do that and verify that you've downloaded the files and you have, looks like Paul got it, which is great because he's on a Mac and I'm not sure. Uh, the, the, the Mac is really nice for the next step, which is where we plug in the Mayfly the Macs and also Windows 10 usually does a good job of automatically doing some stuff. I believe one or two of you are still on Windows 7, so we might have a little bit of a hiccup with that, but um, most of this should go pretty quick. A couple of years ago, back with uh, Windows XP and even older Windows versions, this stuff was way more complicated and we had to do a lot more manual stuff. All right, I'm just kind of talking to make sure everybody's got to this step of downloading that libraries.zip file and having it somewhere on their computers. Everybody got that? Is it okay that I download it on my um, USB as well? For yeah, that's fine. as long as it's somewhere on your machine, because what we're going to do is now take those files and stick them in the correct location. 
So um, there is an automated way to do this. We're working on that for future updates. So th this could be a little bit easier for most people, but for right now, this is the way we're doing it. So if you go to, um, now that we've installed the Arduino IDE on everybody's computer, if you go to the, like the My Documents or the, the Documents folder of Windows, um, you know, which in my case, if you, it's on quick access, you might also find it on like this PC. You've got a list of downloads, music, videos, there's pictures, all, you'll see like a list of your, of your, uh, your common Windows folders. There should be one called Documents. And if you use your computer for other stuff that you probably got maybe Windows documents and letters or spreadsheets or any other stuff. So your folder is probably going to be way more uh, crowded than this. This is a laptop we've only used for a handful of workshops, so there's not a lot of stuff in there. But you should have this folder called documents. And uh, in there, there'll be a folder called Arduino. And that's something that the Arduino program put there when we installed the software. It creates a folder, and that's where the Arduino program puts any sketches and programs you write. So if you program your Mayfly to blink the lights every five seconds on and off, and you save that little program, it's going to stick it in this document slash Arduino folder. Um, and the, that's also where the libraries, these are user supplied, user supplied libraries, and that's where these libraries are. But if we click in there, you might have a libraries folder, you might not. Is it, do, do, you, do you guys have a libraries and it's just empty or is it not even there? Do you have it? Okay, because sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. If it's there, um, it should be empty unless you've already done a sketch or something yourself. What, what we need to do is take that, zipped libraries file that we downloaded from GitHub and put it in here in the document slash Arduino folder. Uh, Michelle says she's got a readme in there. So does Levi. Yeah, there's, there's probably a readme in there and it probably just says put your libraries in here. So that's fine if you've got a readme in there. Um, that's good that it, that file has been created. So if you go to your zip file and the original zip that we downloaded, you got to double click on the zip to go into it. So remember, if you go into libraries.zip, it takes you into a folder called libraries. So that's where we want to be. We don't want to be using the raw zip. We got to be using within the zip. If we take that libraries folder and click and drag it into the document slash Arduino folder and then let it go, it's going to copy 1,219 libraries into the Arduino, uh, my document, the my document slash Arduino folder. This is the part that if you don't put it in the right folder, we're gonna end up with a nested, we're gonna have a libraries within libraries or we're gonna have it in the wrong location and then the Arduino program will choke on it when we try to use it. So um, this is the hard part about making sure we copied this in the right location. So now after it's on mine, after it's done, it's a little process of unzipping. If I click on libraries, instead of just having a readme in there by itself, I now have 36 folders inside document slash, ar slash Arduino slash libraries. Hey Shannon, um, there's yeah. a few questions in the chat um, from Zach and Paul. Maybe we should just confirm that everyone is at the place they need to be. There were some questions about the two libraries folders. Yeah, that's what I was saying. So if you take, if you click and drag libraries, it can't be the library zip. You got to be within library zip if you're in here. There's a couple of different ways you can do it. One is you can just go to this list of all 36 libraries and select them all by doing control A or go up to uh, the menu and, and then copying all of those and pasting all of them manually. I was just trying to do it slightly simpler by just having you click and drag libraries from here to libraries over there. Um, your Windows program or Mac should be smart enough to know 
oh, like if, if you take, you know, vacation photos off your USB drive and you drag them into your hard drive and there's a folder called vacation photos, it's going to put them in the matching directory. It's the same thing here. So it's, it's going to put them in the library's folder. What we don't want is to have, if you click on this, we don't want to have another libraries inside there and then another one. So it's just, um, it gets a little bit, you don't want nested libraries and it can't be just the zip file. You've got to do the unzipped uh, files so that when you click on Arduino slash library, you get a list of actual files here. <clears throat> We're hoping that this process will be a little bit more streamlined maybe for the next workshop, but um, for now, this is the, uh, the manual way to do it because if you go, there's a lot of other libraries you can use with a Mayfly. You don't have to use ours. Um, and if you happen to want to program even any other Arduino board or anything else, this is the method for downloading libraries from uh, a lot of websites, manually putting them in this folder and then allowing you to use those libraries to program whatever board you're using. <clears throat> so this is a method that kind of applies to everybody. And if for some reason you want to do this later or you really need some help, there's some instructions here on that GitHub site where we got the file from that explain where, what folder to put these in. And don't click the uh, clone button and make sure to do it in the right location. So it's, uh, these instructions are written here and I believe they're also probably in our um, online manual that we share too. But that, that was the major thing of what we needed to do, the two steps. Um, and uh, for the next little bit, we're not gonna do any, anything else with those libraries. We just needed to get them in there. So Bob, you won't get too far behind um, if you need a little more time to sort that out. So- Yeah, <clears throat> if, Paul, if, if, um, if somebody can help me in the, uh, on the side screen, I'd appreciate it. Yep. Um, so the, the one catch about these libraries are, is we've already started our Mayfly, or excuse me, the Arduino program when we were configuring it just a little bit ago. So while the Arduino IDE program is open, if you go and dump a bunch of libraries in its library folder, it doesn't know that you did that because it only checks that folder when it first starts up. And so this is a tip. If you happen to do this any other time, like I said, if you buy a, a, another Mayfly board, like one of these blue ones, and you want to hook up some sensor, and you like a humidity sensor, and you find a library, on a website that says to use this sensor, download this file and stick it in your libraries. Well, you can do that and then put the file in there and then plug it all up and run it and it's not gonna work. You have to close the Arduino IDE completely, close all your Arduino windows and then restart it because at startup, it goes into that library folder and checks to see what's in there and then can kind of keep that in its memory when it's using your sketch. So, um, that's, that's something that does trip up a lot of people who are kind of new to using Arduino. So you can see here, I'm going to just kind of minimize a few of these. Um, if, let's, um, I see the easiest way to show that something has happened. So if you have not restarted your, your Arduino program yet, if you go down and look through, there's some example sketches under file. This is where the computer um, already has a bunch of software installed to talk to our <clears throat> the sketches and programs on it. Um, but it's got a bunch of other examples. If I close the Arduino window and then double click on it and restart it, You'll see here in just a few minutes. Some people's uh, program will start up really quick. This one takes a little bit longer <clears throat> on this workshop. And Michelle, I see a question. I'm gonna get to that in just a second. So now if you go to file <clears throat> and example, and if you scroll down through the list, you'll see there's a whole bunch of things in the examples now for Enviro DIY, modular sensors, and all sorts of um, examples that we've included for talking to a variety of sensors that were not on the list already. So if you're able to see, if you scroll down the list under file example, <clears throat> and you scroll down the list and you see these two different Enviro DIY 
options in your menu, then you have copied your libraries to the correct location, you've restarted, and your program sees it. It looks like Paul's doing great. Um, so that's where we're going to be using the sketch uh, later, I guess tomorrow. Um, tomorrow morning, the first thing we do is go in there and get a sketch. While I'm waiting for everybody to make sure you, at that point, um, Michelle just asked, is the, the libraries for talking to a turbidity sensor included in here? Yes, they are. Um, there's libraries for talking to, I don't know, well, there's 36 different libraries in here. Most of them are separate sensors and devices, and within those, there's different versions and, and, um, and spinoffs and, and alternates for things. So you can see here, we've got barometers in here. There's dissolved oxygen, there's temperature sensors, um, SDI-12, which is um, the type of sensor that the turbidity sensor is going to be. There's, it's, there's a light sensor, we've got LCD screens. So we just installed the, um, all the backup information that a Mayfly needs to talk to pretty much any sensor that we've ever seen or think that we need to talk to. And a lot of them have a very generic input on them or a sensor output so that they connect to a Mayfly with no trouble at all. So now that we've done this, you should be good to go. If for some reason we update some stuff, there may be a time later where you'll want to grab some updated files and we will have a better way of uh, updating people with those later. So, um, um, so yeah, it's it's nice that uh, once we've done this, we don't have to do this ever again unless you'd want to start this on a new laptop. So I did this, you know, like three years ago on one of my laptops and haven't touched it since. So this is the the most brutal part of the whole process is getting your computer set up with a Mayfly. And at this point, you can hook up any Mayfly you want. I've hooked up, you know, several thousand Mayflies to this one laptop as I program them before we send them off to Amazon and to other people. So um, each, uh, once you've done this, you can just continually plug things into it and it's, it'll, uh, it's, it's good to go. So this was the worst part of the whole workshop, I think. And again, this is the thing that we try to avoid by just giving you a pre-programmed laptop at a workshop. So um, I'm amazed we got through it all in less than an hour. So that was really good. Um, it looks like, um, I know there's probably a million questions you guys have, and I think we might have a little room for some Q&A if we don't have any major um, problems. Um, but um, does anybody have any difficulty that you really need to, not, not just a curious question about what we're going to do later, but would, was, did anybody, is there anybody who's still stuck with getting the libraries installed and getting it to the point where you see uh, EnviroDIY in your list of examples? seeing how quickly you guys are navigating all of this and getting everything set up, I don't think that we're going to need that entire hour and a half. So I think we're going to move lesson three and four into the afternoon. Cool. Um, and, and that'll be a much better use for our time. So um, I think that'll work out great. I just, again, I didn't want to add too many, too many steps and too much bouncing back and forth between web browsers and other things here while we're doing zoom, just in case uh, we all had technical trouble, but um seems like you guys are all Zoom veterans, or at least pretty good at navigating all of this, uh, this craziness. So I'm um, uh, impressed with how we, we just kind of looked at the, our previous workshops and said, oh, we think we can do this in an hour and a half, and we got it done in uh, less than an hour today. So I think um, that, was, uh, that was really good on all of your part. So um, does anybody have any quick questions? Um, we're going to see if we can stay on and help Bob, but does anybody else have any questions about what we did this morning? or um, issues or anything that you want to know before we go to lunch? Looks like we're good. All right. you, can, you can leave your, the IDE program open or you can close it. You can, if you're hanging up and um, closing up your laptop to you know, eat lunch or whatever, that's fine. We've, it, nothing is, uh, none of these programs are like, once it's open, don't close it kind of thing. Now that we've told the program what a Mayfly is and installed the libraries, it'll always be there. So if you close it, open it later, it's going to know. So there's nothing fragile about the software anymore. So, um, so that's pretty good. Michelle's asking what we should have out after lunch. So that's a good question um, because we're going to all going to need to root around inside the box of parts that I sent you to get out some stuff. So if you want to have some of that handy, 
before uh, we get back on the call that I'll maybe go a little quicker. So let me see. I'm going to go back to Dave's slide. <clears throat> and um, okay. I want to share this guy with everybody. All right, so you should have uh, that picture to help you identify everything. And <clears throat> what you're going to need for this afternoon session is letter F, which is the gigantic Mayfly uh, circuit board. And if you haven't already done it, if you open up the, um, the lid to your Mayfly box, you know, the, the Mayfly was in the little plastic bag. Um, and uh, the lid is just kind of held on inside the bag that you don't have to unscrew it. Once you open that up, you can kind of take all the contents out very carefully. There's going to be a bag with some memory card in it, a bag with a battery, a bag with a little adapter. You'll have two colored cables. There's going to be a USB cable and a, uh, another little green connector. And uh, I think you're also going to have maybe a cell phone module or something in there. Um, and at the bottom of that big pile of parts is your Mayfly board. So you're gonna to wanna to have that handy. And then underneath your Mayfly board, if you, this is the first time you're opening your kit, you'll find the SIM card. And the SIM card looks like a credit card. It's just a piece of plastic. Um, it's kind of purple on one side and we don't have a good photo of it. The photo, it's letter V on your list of parts. Um, it's uh, that's the little card as it's broken out and I'm, if any of you have ever dealt with the sim card on your cell phone you'll know it's a tiny tiny little chip and um, the the card that you have is a much bigger card and there's these little pieces of plastic that you have to pop out later don't pop it out now because these are very easy to use looks like Bob's holding his up so he got his that's good um, so don't pop it out just yet. We, we don't need to pop the little card out until tomorrow. So keep the whole thing intact because it's too easy to lose that little tiny chip. Um, and, uh, but what you're gonna need is there's a, um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now so I can show you mine. Um, if we go back here, if you see my, on the bottom of the white side of the card is a gigantic uh, 19 digit serial number and a barcode. That 19 digit number is the number that you're going to need to register your SIM card when we go do that in step uh, lesson two of the afternoon session. So just have that card handy, but don't pop the little card out. And if we have time uh, and everything goes well with the website stuff, then what we're gonna do is plug the Mayfly into your laptop so that you can watch the lights blink and see some data go across uh, with your laptop and all to kind of have at least some fun hands-on stuff to do. So leave your Mayfly out handy and you should have the little black uh, coiled up USB cable. Uh, you'll need that to connect to your, um, your laptop. You should not need anything other than your Mayfly, the cable and the SIM card for the afternoon session. Um, everything else will be uh, dealing with first thing in the morning tomorrow. Okay, um, so why don't we, if, if we're good, Shannon, why don't we break for lunch? Um, we were figuring that everyone could just disable audio and video and just keep Zoom open so that the, so you don't have to log in. If you want to totally log out and log back in, you're welcome to, just make sure to use that exact same link. The, the waiting room is disabled, so you'll be able to come right back in. But if you, but if you just want to stay on the Zoom for simplicity, just do that and disable audio and video. Um, so it's 11.34 right now. Let's try to be prompt with starting back up at 1. And um, maybe uh, uh, all of us Stroud folks will stay on to work with Bob and um, Paul. I don't know if you're if if you feel compelled to stay on as well since you have a Mac and you were providing some advice um, to Bob. Maybe you can do that too. If you're busy, fine. But if you um, want to stay on just in case you might have some insights on the Mac user um, interface, then that might be helpful. So 
Otherwise, let's all go to lunch. You can disable um, your video and um, keep your audio disabled and we'll reconvene at one. Beginning recording. Take it away, Shannon. All right. So, um, yeah, I hope everybody had a good lunch and um, we didn't have any other questions or issues come up that I know about. Um, so I think we were able to help uh, John and Bob get all their stuff sorted out, especially with the thanks of Zach there. So we appreciate that. Um, and uh, yeah, so this afternoon we're going to talk about some of the online portions of this. This is a step that we uh, haven't had to do most of the time because we don't use to monitor my watershed data portal in our uh, workshops before because um, this the, the way we're using this is all fairly new and we haven't had to do that many workshops lately. So this is another one of those um, uh, lessons that you guys are going to be a little bit of a guinea pig to see how things go. But um, all of what we do tomorrow is stuff that we've done before. So we've got a good handle on tomorrow. So just the next little bit's going to be the, the last little bit of a groundbreaking trial and error here. So we've got two things that we want to do. Um, <clears throat> if I share my screen again, I think you may have seen the slide that I had up earlier, which said, um, Boom, boom, boom. There we go. Um, we're going to do lesson one is monitor my watershed. I think most of you are familiar with that. That's the website that we use for hosting all of our online data. And then lesson two is working with Hologram. And Hologram is the SIM card provider that we use with our um, data loggers. And I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, there's a reason we don't use just Verizon or AT&T or somebody like that. And so this requires us to go to the Hologram website and set up an account with them so that we can pay for the data plan that your logger is going to start using tomorrow. Um, when you activate a plan, it does take sometimes five or ten minutes. And if things are really busy, it might take a half an hour or an hour before your card is thoroughly active. So that's the reason we're activating the card today so that tomorrow when we plug the card in, um, and turn the logger on, everything should have been activated overnight and you'll be good to go. If we try to do things too quickly, then sometimes the card uh, doesn't always work and then everybody sits around for a while waiting for their account to get activated. So um, by doing the activation stuff today, that gives us time for everything to um, kind of fall in the line for tomorrow when we uh, put all of that stuff uh, together and turn it on. And then assuming we have time left over uh, before we're done at three, uh, we'll do that quick intro to the board. And if everybody's feeling adventurous, we'll actually plug the mayflies into your computer and you'll get to see some data going through and some lights blinking and all that. So, and then we'll have some uh, Q and A uh, wrap up at the end. So, that's kind of what I got there. Um, I assume everybody's still got like a browser window um, open somewhere on their computer, um, whether they're using Chrome or um, Firefox or Internet Explorer or um, any of the browser of your choice. So we're going to need to go to a browser window. And I think I'm going to. Um, I think I'll just do this. I'll continue sharing my screen so you can watch what I'm doing here. I'm going to close the Arduino window because we don't need that. And um, what they were saying earlier was it's kind of nice if you close all the windows that we're done with just so you don't have 900 windows open by the end of the day. Um, our library zip file we don't need anymore. You don't need this card there. Um, so I'm just going to close just about everything here except for my Zoom window. And then I'm going to open a website. And uh, you can go ahead and op open this if you haven't already done it and type it in monitormywatershed.org. And you can get to this site from any of our, from the Stroud website, from the EnviroDIY website. Um, 
There's a wiki watershed, which is the overall, um, the, the name of the overall tools um, suite that we have. There's all different, I think Dave showed a slide earlier of all the different components of wiki watershed. Um, model by watershed is a um, really neat interactive tool <clears throat> that you can use to simulate your watershed, um, get a whole bunch of neat parameters. Um, so that's modeling using, you know, you can, you can simulate rainfall on a, wa on a watershed and see the discharge that comes off or something like that. But this is monitoring your watershed, which is looking at the live data that comes in from any of our data loggers. You can also input data here using um, uh, more of a, an old school um, hand method of uh, if you have just a data file of, of readings you've collected, um, you can input that. So um, for us, it makes it a really nice place to connect all of our uh, data loggers to a website and have the data show up live and streaming online and viewable anywhere in the world. So I think when you zoom, when you first start off, you see a, a fairly zoomed in map. But if you kind of zoom out, you can see how many stations we've got all over the world. Um, the color code tells you whether or not it's active and when it was last heard from. We've placed about maybe 250 to 300 stations are owned by Stroud or EnviroDIY or we have some part in their deployment. There's 420 stations on this map right now. Um, and uh, not all of those are ours. So like over 100 of the stations on this map are people that uh, I don't know who they are. They bought a Mayfly online or even some other commercial data logger and they just want to have an online uh, source for putting their data so they can send their data here. So you don't have to have a Mayfly to send data to this website. But it's very handy because you can zoom in. If I go up here and click on maybe one of Paul's stations. Um, let's see, which one should we do? We'll do that one. I was just at this one the other day with Levi. So you click on the station, it takes you to a map that shows you where it is in the world. You can see it on a satellite map or a regular map. So it's kind of good to kind of give you some um, context of where you are at. Gives you some information here about the location, when it was deployed, when it was registered, uh, the owner at the top. And there's some other information in here. And then this is the part where everybody really wants, likes to get down to. And we'll give maybe a little bit better tour of this in a little bit of how you can see more of the time series data. So the first 72 hours or the, the most recent 72 hours is shown here on the screen. And you can see the different parameters of water conductivity, turbidity, temperature, water temperature, logger temperature. You can see the battery voltage to know whether or not your battery is charging properly. And you can see your cell phone strength, it's about 71%. So that's, that's all pretty decent. You can see, looking at water depth, you can tell it hasn't rained very much in the last three days. Well, it hasn't rained at all. There's been no input at all. Stream's been going down. And you see some nice patterns that kind of coincide with temperature, but if you also plot it by time of day, you'd probably see that it varies depending on the time of day. And we'll get into reasons why you might see that later. Um, so this is the... Uh, destination of your online data that your Mayfly is going to be transmitting tomorrow. So in order for you to send data to this website, you have to register and be a registered user. And then you have to create your station. And then you have to create the um, individual sensor parameters that your station is going to transmit. So there's a couple of levels of steps that we have to do. So the first is for you to register as a user. So I'll go up here and sign out. So if I'm a brand new user, when you go to monitormywatershed.org, the first thing you see in the middle of the page is a big sign up button. So if you haven't already done it, I think a couple of you may have worked ahead and done this, but if you haven't already done it, um, you click on sign up and give it your, first name and last name and your email that you'd like all the uh, information sent to. Preferably it's an email that you have access to right now in case you need to uh, 
go in there and get like, I think they send you a confirmation email you might have to click on because we don't want just everybody signing up, uh, spam people, registering accounts and all. So I believe there is a verification email you've got to click on. So go ahead and enter in all that information. What's really helpful is if you put an organization in here so that we can sort you. If, if just random people sign up and send data to the website, that's cool and all, but sometimes we have no idea who they are. Is it just a hobbyist who wants to see the temperature and is, you know, the stream in the backyard? Or is this somebody who works for a university or an agency or a watershed group? So it's, it's helpful for us and it's probably helpful for you so that if you put yourself on a map and someone sees, oh, look, here's somebody from this organization who's got a monitor, I have a question about it, they'll know how to contact you and give you some good exposure that your organization is out there. So it helps if you put that in there. If later on you want to change your organization because you misspelled it or you wanted to join another organization or whatever, you can go in and edit that information later. But it's helpful if you put that in now just so we keep track of who's who. And then if you want to read the terms of use, you can um, and click on the agree button, hit register, and then it will allow you, I believe, to log in, but then you may have to um, verify that email if you want to get the uh, full uh, account access kind of thing. So I've just been kind of talking, hoping that everybody was in the background typing in that info and submitting and registering. Um, so exact's all set up. Is anybody having trouble getting registered? Remember, if, if you've got questions that aren't super vital to interrupt me with, you can always ask it in the chat window. I'm monitoring the chat. Rachel's working, uh, watching the chat too. Um, okay. So I assume everybody's doing good, everybody's registered. I'm gonna go ahead and log in to the site using my info. I have administrator privileges to this site, so I'm gonna see a little bit different pages than you in a couple of places, but for the most part, you guys will see, um, you'll see the same thing I will see, but I'll, get a little bit extra in a couple of places. <clears throat> All right, I, I'm trying to think here. We've got, I mailed out nine stations. Uh, Rob's got two of them and uh, Michelle's got two. So there were seven different users, I guess, all together that, that have stations today. Um, I hope that at least for, for one of those, for one for Rob and one for Michelle, if you know where you want to put these stations, um, even if you don't know exactly, if you really want, you can just put your house on there. But what we're gonna do is create a site and put it on a map. You, you, if you create a, a, a station and monitor my watershed, you have to give it a location because it's all kind of map based. And you can just kind of click and put it out in the middle of the ocean or you can put it in the desert. You can put it wherever you want, but it's always gonna show up there on the map. And I've done some testing where I just randomly clicked and then I get an email from somebody a few days later going, do you really have a station out in the middle of the Atlantic? And you know, I put one down in the Gulf of Mexico just cause it was easy for me to find it on the map while I was sending test data. But then you might have somebody wondering, is there really data going there? So for, for to keep everybody uh, from confusing any other users who view the site, if you want, um, try to find either the location that you're hoping to put this station or put it in your neighborhood or your, somewhere near you for now, um, just so that we can kind of keep track of where they are in the real world. So uh, I believe some of you guys are up in uh, New York. Um, so we'll, we'll see where you are once your sites pop up on the map. So again, I'm just kind of, for organization, um, no, you shouldn't put Stroud, you put your own organization of who you belong to. Um, if you're part of the Deer Park group, then I would put that. Um, if you don't have an organization, just put self or you can leave it blank. It's, it is optional, but um, it's basically just whoever is sponsoring the stuff, whoever bought the station, this stuff wasn't cheap. So somebody paid for this thing. So uh, I would put their name as the owner of it. 
but again, it depends on who, who's who's kind of claiming this this uh, this station to make sure that. The reason for that is, if you go here, if you see on my window, uh, when you first go to the browse site, you can search the site uh, by the station ID number, the stream name, any of the words that are in this information we'll be putting in. So, if I type the word Michelle in the search box, it'll tell me, it'll show me any station that is owned by somebody named Michelle or any station that's on Michelle Creek or has the word anywhere in it, right? So if you, um, let's see how many people named Bob have a station. Nope, there's no Bobs. Um, there's one Robert over here. So it's basically uh, whatever keywords you put into your descriptions and your site owners, um, if I type in Stroud, you'll see all the stations that are associated with the Stroud Center because uh, we had that name as the ownership. So it's just one other way for, for finding things. And that's a good question, Rob. Yeah, you can change the location at any time. And we've done that. We put in the station and let's say uh, we don't like it there because uh, it keeps getting vandalized or it got flooded out and we had to move it to a new, new, new location. Once you've put it on a map, you can easily go in and drag the dot to a new location. So it's not permanent. The only thing that's, um, I guess really nothing is permanent about the whole thing. And if after a while you just don't like that station and you want to make a new one, you can just delete this. So what we're doing today can kind of be seen as, uh, seen as temporary and uh, you can delete it all. You'd have to start all over again. Once we program a board tomorrow, it will be kind of tied to this demo. But then once, if you decide you don't like this and you want to delete it all, you can redo it and then take this code that we're generating today and put that in tomorrow's logger and all that. So nothing is set in stone. It's all a, a easily changeable system if that's what you uh, need to do. All right. So again, I'm just kind of killing time, hoping everybody's gotten the system and got their emails, everything's verified and we're all ready to go. So if you go back up to the main page uh, on, on the main toolbar at the top of monitor my watershed. You, you, if you were already following along, you may have been browsing by hitting the browse button. So what you want to do is go up to my sites um, and click on that, and that will take you to the page where it lists all the sites that are associated with you. So there's a couple here. Um, this is a demo that someone took to Cleveland for a conference, and it's still, even though it's sitting in my office, the, the last time I updated the website, I said it was in Cleveland. So um, I should probably edit that and move it back to my office. But these are a couple other stations that I deployed that um, I just kept my name on. Usually we do, if I put it out for people, I will uh, change it to their name, but these are ones I haven't done. So for you, um, you'll scroll down to where it says my registered sites and you'll have nothing there. It'll be blank because you'll have no sites associated with your accounts. So over on the right hand side, there's that handy little blue button that says register a new site. <clears throat> so if you click on that, that will take you to the site creation page. So this is where we create a new website. And I assume if anybody's having trouble, you can ping us in the uh, chat box and we'll get you up to speed. But we're going to just kind of roll through this. Um, you choose, uh, Deployed by, this is where you could enter your name or your organization, but if you're gonna be the one maybe going out and installing it and you wanna get the credit, put it in there, it's kind of handy. Again, this can be changed later. Um, we're gonna say, so I'm already listed because I'm registered. There we go. So I'm putting my name in there. Site code, this is where you come up with a code for your stream. Um, this is, uh, one of the things, this is required. This is how your station is going to be referred to in the URL or the address of the um, uh, Monitor My Watershed. So you, you can't leave this blank. Some of the boxes down here say optional and then you can leave them optional, but you gotta give it at least some sort of code or a name or something to, um, to call your station. And most of the time when we deploy data loggers, we give it like a serial number or some sort of, if you've got more than one, it's really nice. You don't want to just call it Mayfly logger because that's pretty generic. And if you get two, what are you going to call the second one? So call it a name, you know, or a number, or uh, just come up with some sort of code that you guys want to call it. But again, it has to be unique. If, if somebody else in this group calls it logger one, 
then someone else can't call it logger one also because their addresses will overlap. So it's got to be a unique enough name. So don't call it something too generic. But give it a name. And if you wonder what to type in, if you if you um, hover over the little gray question mark, you'll get a nice little pop-up that tells you what to type in these boxes. So it says enter a brief unique text string to identify your site, like Dell underscore Phil for the Delaware River in Philadelphia or something like that. So if you know your creek name, you can do that, or if you have a code name or um, something that you'd like to put in there. So we're just gonna call this, um, see somebody called this WKSC12 because this was workshop 12. So we'll just, we'll, we'll do that same thing again. Um, uh, and then because someone already created one, we'll have letter B. So this is workshop kit. I don't know what SC stands for. And then 12B, right? So that's just, that's what I'm going to call my station. That will be the code that I will refer to my station. And then you can give it a site name. Um, this is where you want to give it something uh, a little more um, uh, user friendly in terms of language. So I think it says here, enter a brief but descriptive name for your site. So as such as Delaware River near Phillipsburg. So this is where you want to give it um, something a little bit more descriptive so that people understand what it is looking from the description. Then we want to give it some type of description of the, the type of site that it is. And this is part of our record keeping stuff that we do behind the scenes with all the data. We kind of need to know, is this an atmospheric site, like a weather station? Is this somebody's house, is it a lab, a lake, uh, a well? Uh, maybe a soil pit, a stream, a stream gauge, tidal streams, weather stations, wetlands. And if for some reason you don't even see what you want on there, you can let us know and we'll add it to the list. I think you may even be able to add one yourself. But for the most part, it's kind of, I think we've put in most of the observation or most of the um, options that we would think. I guess you could use other if you don't know what type it is. But since most of you have a CTD sensor, you're probably going to measure a stream. But if you're measuring a lake, then you go up here and put it in a lake. Or if you're putting this in a well, you can put well on there. So it just kind of helps people when they're trying to um, put some context between uh, the data and what type of stream it is uh, or site it is. And then you got your stream name. You could give it something like, uh, if you happen to know the name of your stream, we're going to call this test. The name of my stream is Test Creek. <coughs> I don't know my major watershed. That's okay. I don't need it. This is all optional. Um, but the other thing that is required is the latitude and longitude. <clears throat> and you don't have to put in the elevation because it can actually get that itself. So how do we figure out what our latitude and longitude is for the um, location of the, the site? Well, if you have a phone and you've got it on GPS mode, you can get the coordinates from your phone that way. But we've put in this really handy tool so that if you go over here to your little Google map and uh, let's say we've got a station in downtown Philadelphia. I'm going to put one right in City Hall, okay? So if you look at the bottom where latitude and longitude is, it's blank right now. But if I go up to the City Hall on the map and then I just click, it will automatically populate the latitude and longitude on the map. So your, uh, the Google Maps should be pretty good resolution enough that you should be able, there's, it, there's no search feature, so you kind of have to click and zoom and pan. So if you're not sure exactly where you need to go, uh, find a local reference and zoom in and kind of move it around. So it's a little bit hard that way because you can't like enter a street address like a normal Google Map thing. But basically find the place that you want on a map and once you've tapped it, it will automatically fill in the latitude and longitude for you uh, right down to what, five digits, which will get you to within a couple of feet of the station. It also will auto populate the, uh, the elevation. So looking at this, I can tell that City Hall of Philadelphia is 14 meters above sea level. So, um, which is what MSL over here is for. So, um, and we do everything in metrics, so that's, that's meters. So, it's kind of handy if you want to, um, like if sometimes you click on a station, you realize you're up in the mountains, it's a couple thousand feet high or something. So it's interesting just to, to get the elevation data to go with that site. So, um, so there you go. So you've got your site, stream name, all this stuff is entered. And um, 
you know what, I'm actually going to move this because I don't want somebody to think that there really is a stream gauge at the, uh, so we're going to move it over here to the middle of the Schuylkill River. That's a little bit safer. So we don't make people think there's a stream gauge right in downtown Philly. So on the Google here in Philly is a station. So you can see all I'm doing is clicking and moving the map. So at any time later, you want to move your station, just bring up this page um, and uh, click on wherever you want to go on the map and it will automatically adjust those lat long. All right, so that's all you got to do. And then over here in the notes field, if you really want, you can add some other information. Like you could put, uh, you know, station built by so-and-so installed on private property um, with a CTD sensor, or you don't have to put anything at all, but sometimes it's kind of nice because we can actually look at the map and tell a, a little bit more description about a site. But again, you can save that for later since we don't really need that right now. And then there's a handy box here that says, notify me if the site stops receiving sensor data. So there are times where your sta station is set up to send data to this website every five minutes or 10 minutes, whatever you decide. And uh, you could be on vacation or mowing your grass or just hanging out at home. And then all of a sudden your station battery dies or somebody steals it or it gets knocked over or something malfunctions and it's not working. You won't know about it unless you are going to this website all the time to look and see how, um, uh, how your data is doing. So clicking that button, is kind of nice because it will notify you if it's been an hour or two or three, I'm gonna say six hours. So if my site goes offline for six hours, I'm gonna get an email that tells me I should maybe go out and fix it. Uh, that's really, really handy because there are times where people uh, have something happen to their data logger and they don't know about it unless we're looking at it and say, oh, I wonder why this station isn't online and we email them and then they have to go, oh, I didn't know, I haven't looked at my data in a month. So this is kind of handy to, uh, notify you quickly if there's a problem with your station. So you, you can click that box and set it to whatever duration. I would say at least more than an hour because there are times where the cellular network just kind of goes down for a few hours and you don't need to be notified every time that happens. So, you know, give it at least a couple hours or six hours or even 24 if you really want, but um, it's just at least nice to have some sort of notification. Once you've entered all of that stuff, then you just click register site and takes a couple of seconds here for the website because it's gonna go into its database and create all of the required information for this. All right, and now we have created a site. And if you look at the top up here in my URL, you'll see that it says monitormywatershed.org slash sites shall ask WKSC12B, because that's that unique code that I gave it. So everybody should have that up there. And you can send that address bar to any of your friends or relatives or anybody that you want to say, hey, go check out my data. You send them to that page. This, this will always take them directly to the data page for your sensors, um, it, uh, which is why we had that code in there. And then you can see in the description here at the top of the page, then it's got that the little bit longer uh, words that I wrote. So maybe it would say like, you know, uh, school river upstream of so-and-so bridge, and then has that little code. So you've got some easily readable human language followed by that code, which is the uh, website URL. <clears throat> and if for some reason that you do want to edit your station later, like the location or description up in the upper right hand corner, you hit that blue edit button and that's where you would change your location or anything else. If at the end of this workshop, you decide you don't like this station and you wanna delete it, or you've accidentally made one and you don't need it anymore or whatever, hit the delete button up there and it will say, are you sure you really wanna delete this station? And you say, yes. Once you've done that, you can't, you can't get it back. There's no way, there's no like recycle bin to get it back. So don't delete it unless you're really sure that you don't need it um, and you're ready to uh, erase it from the system. So again, I'm just kind of talking, hoping everybody's kind of working along on their machines and getting to the same point. Is everybody there? I'm doing good. Looks like there's some chats about what to name things and all since, yeah, I guess it's, it's great as you guys are all working together. Sometimes we do workshops where there's like 10 or 12 unrelated uh, participants that aren't going to see each other anymore after this workshop. So they don't need to coordinate between names. So it's great that you guys are um, 
are taking care of that. And again, if you do need to change even your site code or any of that stuff, you, you want to change, you can change that later and it will change it in the website address. Also, it's, it's not super permanent. It's just kind of good if we um, get it as close to possible here at the beginning. So um, I guess a little background on why we're using this website. I used to use uh, my own homemade uh, uh, data website back in the early days of the Mayfly logger, uh, where we had a couple dozen stations at the Stroud Center and nearby. And it was pretty easy to manage because I was building the stations and I was handling the data and it was, it was not too bad. But now that we're allowing anyone in the world to send data to a website, we needed to have a system that uh, could be uh, managed by basically the users themselves. And uh, just to give you an idea of the scope of the data that this system is handling, uh, one data logger sends about, well, it sends eight parameters usually. If we have temperature, conductivity, depth, logger temperature, uh, logger battery voltage, and then there's usually turbidity, there's two scales of turbidity, high and low range, and then there's cell phone signal strength. So that's eight parameters. So if you have one logger that's sending eight parameters, uh, let's see, every five minutes, right? That's usually what we do because uh, most of our streams, uh, if you're on a really, really big river, you probably can get away with, you know, 10 minutes or even 15 minute data gaps. But on these smaller streams, you really need to be recording data every five minutes to be able to see the small changes that happen. So sending eight parameters every five minutes results in 2,300 data points every day, right? Because it's sending 12 of those every hour. Um, so you get 2,300 points a day from one station. So in one year, one station is going to generate 850,000 data points. So that's almost a million data points per year for just one station. Right now we have about 300 stations that the Stroud Center is keeping an eye on. So if you add all of that up, those stations send in this almost 700 thousand points in one day, which adds up to about 250 million points a year. So after four years, the system will handle a billion data points. So, and it's got to be able to graph them and chart and put them on these time series graphs and all sorts of, you know, analytical tools. It's not just storing it, it's putting it in a database and then using it. So that's an awful lot of data that is, um, you know, uh, not easy to to handle so we had to come up with a system that could keep track of all of those individual uh, data points and the sensors and the sensor readings and all of that and we wanted to make sure that system was secure enough that you can't just guess somebody's station and password and send data into their uh, database to corrupt their data or download it if they didn't want it downloaded so we had to come up with like a, a secure method of handling all the data. And so the team that developed this program and the whole uh, data uh, monitor my watershed data website uh, uses a system called UUIDs, which is a unique uh, identifier. Um, and that's what we're going to work on now, which is, let's see. Yeah, I guess we can do this part now. So this is the part where we have to create the actual sensors that are gonna be on your station because it's gonna generate that unique code for each one of your parameters like water depth and temperature and battery voltage. So we've gotta get all of this part sorted out today because it's gonna generate a little chunk of code that we're gonna put into our Arduino program tomorrow to customize our Mayfly because each one of you has a unique uh, bunch of numbers that you've gotta send to this website in order for us to know which station you're talking about. So uh, if you're on your individual, don't go to my site, but go to you know my sites, click on the station you just created, and then scroll down about halfway down your page, you're gonna see sensor observations at this site. And this is where you would normally see the little graphs. And you don't have any graphs because you don't have any sensors associated yet. So this is where we've got to create sensor and sensor parameter profiles for your site. So over on the right hand side of the page, you have a little blue button that says, or green, greenish blue button that says manage sensors. 
You're going to click on that. And that takes you to the Manage Sensor page for your station. So you'll see no sensors have been added. This is where you will need to tell it what type of sensor you've got. So um, if you, uh, and later on when you guys add turbidity or any other sensor or parameter you would want to do, you're going to follow the same method to update your station. You can add or delete parameters at any time. So what we have to do is go to the plus mark here and a window will pop up. I'm going to zoom out a little bit here. There we go. Um, so this window pops up that says add new sensor. So if you look, click here, this is a list of all the sensor manufacturers that we currently use at the Stroud Center or ones that we've identified that people would want to use either with a Mayfly or some system that's sending data to us. Um, if for some reason somebody wants a sensor that's not on the list, they send us info, we can update it. But since all of you are using just a Mayfly and <clears throat> a uh, CTD sensor, we'll be able to use that. Um, these CTD sensors were made by a company called, well right now they're called Meter Group. And um, you might, if you've got some literature that came with it, maybe you just got the sensor in a bag. But um, the literature and everything with the sensors uh, mentions meter group. And I think it's called a Hydros 21. Well, this sensor was originally called uh, the uh, CTD 10 and it was made the company's name about a year ago and more was uh, called Decagon Devices. So we haven't updated this system with, actually we do have meter, maybe, yeah, we don't have the meter group sensor in here. So we, we could probably do that today, but we don't have time to do that right now. So for now, we can change this at any time. This isn't super vital. But what we have to do is go in here to uh, Decagon, because that's the name of the company that used to make this sensor uh, before they merged and changed their name last year. So call it Decagon. And then you'll see in the list of sensor models after you've chosen Decagon, they, they make soil moisture sensors, conductivity sensors, and conductivity temperature depth, depth sensors at CTD-10. So you're going to want to choose Decagon and CTD-10 for this sensor. Now, the CTD sensor does conductivity and depth and temperature. So there's three parameters for one sensor. That means we have to do this whole step three different times because we have to do it for each one of the parameters. So it's a little bit redundant and kind of boring, but that's just the way the data system is set up. You can't just say, I got one sensor with three inputs and it will create three parameters all at once. So you've got to go through this little step here three times. So the easiest way to keep track of this is just to go uh, numerically down the list. So we start with clicking on the first option under measured variable and just click Decagon CTD 10 underscore con, C-O-N-D. That stands for conductivity. So you click on that and then the unit of measure will pop up. The units that we measure conductivity in is uh, micro siemens per centimeter. That's the default unit that comes with the, uh, some people measure it in different, uh, different degrees of units. Um, if it's uh, super uh, uh, salty water or something like that in the ocean. But in our small streams, we usually measure it in micro siemens per centimeter. So that's your only option. Sample medium. This is again, just kind of helpful so that it, whether you're, measuring uh, soil temperature or soil moisture. Um, in our case, we're just measuring liquid water. So we choose that as our sample. And everything else we can leave blank. We, that's all we have to really, we don't have to enter anything else. So, and then you scroll down and then uh, at the bottom of that menu, you'll see add new sensor. So click on that. And then you should see that you now have <clears throat> under measured variable, you'll see Decagon CTD 10 cond, and that will be the conductivity reading for your sensor. So I'm assuming everybody's got that since I don't see a whole lot of puzzled looks or questions in the chat. So now we have to go through and do that two more times for the other two parts of the CTD sensor. So we just go to manufacturer, Decagon, CTD 10, do the second one on the list for depth, now, when you choose this, you get the options of inches or millimeters. The sensor normally spits out the data in centimeters because most scientific instruments will use metric. So 
we are uh, with all of our sensors we always use metrics so click on millimeter and uh, so that when it says because the sensor doesn't tell you I've got you know eight centimeters of water or eight millimeters of water or eight hundred whatever it is it, or eight inches of water it's just going to say 8.0 so it's up to you to know what unit your sensor comes in so that you can adjust this website so if you happen to buy a sensor that spits out Fahrenheit instead of Celsius for temperature, then you're going to want to choose the correct, correct unit. But for our CTDs, they come with millimeter. So we're going to choose that, and then we're going to choose liquid water. Um, if you really want, you could put something in here, like if you know your sensor's uh, a certain depth, you can put that in there, but it's not going to really affect the data. It's just kind of for record keeping. So um, we'll just put that in there. So now we've got water depth, and then we're going to go back and redo the whole thing again. Decagon, CTD 10, temperature, and again, because you have the option of Fahrenheit or Celsius or Kelvin if you really wanted, um, but that's not on the list. But there are people who want their system to report in uh, English units rather than metric, so we will, uh, you can actually put a special script in your logger code that will convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit and transmit that, but it gets kind of confusing that way, so we prefer to leave everything in metric. So choose Celsius and liquid water. This is kind of important to make sure you choose liquid water as the medium for your CTD temperature sensor, and I'll explain more about that in just a second. Then you're going to click add new sensor. If at any point you click outside of one of these boxes, sometimes you end up getting uh, your window, that, that whole sensor uh, parameter thing will uh, jump out and then like the window will go away and you got to start all over again. So just be sure you click right in those boxes because the input window for this is a little finicky. And as Zach just said, there are shortcuts to doing that. If you, if you don't remember uh, the manufacturer or something, you can type in, uh, you know, CTD or meter and, and it will come up and then in your list and you say, oh, meter and then, uh, uh, or decagon, I guess, right? So, um, and if you make a mistake, you can hit the X. So it, there's, you don't have to use the scrolly box if you happen to know, but a lot of times people don't remember what to choose so, or what to type in. So it's easier to just scroll through the list and choose what's there. So I don't need to do this because I've already entered my three CTD parameters. So I'll jump out of that. Uh, <clears throat> so that's the sensor that goes in the water. What's also useful for just diagnostic purposes is to know what is the temperature, or excuse me, what is the battery voltage of your Mayfly board? Because there are times where your station goes offline and it's because the cell phone tower has a problem or somebody stole your station or maybe your battery just died because the squirrel ate the cable that goes from the solar panel to the battery. So it's always good to transmit your battery voltage. So in your list of sensor manufacturers, if you go down to like fifth, sixth one list is Enviro DIY. We're the manufacturer of the Mayfly, so you can choose that. The only sensor uh, that's on the list is the Mayfly data logger itself. And you'll see there's actually four different parameters. We're gonna do the first one, which is Mayfly BAT, which is just short for battery. And that's going to measure in volts. And then for equipment, or excuse me, for sample medium, we put equipment because it's the, um, we're measuring the voltage of a piece of equipment and not some sort of um, actual air, water, sediment, or soil. So we just put equipment in there and that's all we need to do. So we add that to the list. So now we've got three parameters for the water sensor, and now we see we've got an equipment sensor for battery voltage. And what's kind of handy about the Mayfly logger is that it's got an onboard temperature uh, chip. And sometimes it's kind of nice to know, hey, how cold was it last night? Especially in the winter, when uh, you've got really, really cold temperatures that can affect uh, maybe the point at which your water is going to freeze or the, the lifespan of your battery if it's been frozen a lot or cooked a lot with super high temperatures that you kind of need to have a record of that and it's just also kind of nice when you wake up in the morning in the winter you can look at that and say hey what was the air temperature last night you can look at your mayfly logger temp your mayfly logger temp is not going to be very accurate during the summer when the sun is shining on this box and i got one right here behind me 
sun shining on a closed box, it's like a little greenhouse kind of, it will get extra hot. So you can't really trust air temperature, um, but it will tell you what your circuit board and your battery is being uh, subjected to uh, temperature wise. So it's just kind of a nice handy number to do. So we go back in and we say sensor manufacturer, Enviro DIY, Mayfly logger, free RAM and sample number are just some uh, little numbers. If you really want to know how much free space your Mayfly had or like an incrementing sample number, you can do that. We don't need to really do it in this lesson. So we're just going to choose Mayfly temp and Celsius temperature. And again, we're going to mark it as equipment and add new sensor. So now we've got five parameters. And we want to add one more, which is a really helpful one because all of these stations, I think, uh, are going to get your um, cell phone. And you guys all have the new 4G LTE uh, cell phone module. It's kind of nice to know uh, what the signal strength of your cell phone module is. Because if you're having connection issues, because you're in an area where it's only 20% or something, uh, you might wonder, is your station malfunctioning? Or maybe you're just on the fringes of the cell phone range. It's just, again, a nice diagnostic number to have. So um, these cell boards are made by a company called Digi, D-I-G-I. So you'll see them on the list of uh, sensor manufacturers. And you choose the first one on the list. It's the, L, uh, the cellular LTE uh, module there at the top. There's a couple different varieties. It really doesn't matter. This The name is really only just kind of for your uh, benefit, but as long as you've got the LTE in there, you're good. Um, and then there's four different numbers. Uh, there's You can tell the temperature of the cell board, or how long it's been active. Uh, RSSI is received signal strength indicator. Some of our online stations use that. It's just a fancier way of saying signal strength percent and a different way of displaying it. So choose the third one on the list, which is cellular signal percent. And the unit will be percent in dimensions list. So it's just going to be somewhere between zero and 100%. And again, sample medium is going to be equipment. So we add that one to the list. So now we have three water sensors and three equipment sensors. So there's six all together. And if we had turbidity, then you would have two more for that, which usually gives us our, our usual eight parameters per station. So later on, if you uh, buy that turbidity sensor and you want to add it, then this is where you would go into this page and you would, this is where you manage your sensors. Everything's good to go here. And if you buy a new sensor later, you just hit that plus mark and go through the list and choose uh, the type of sensor you've got and it will be added to your list. So now that we've got all those sensors, we can go back at the very bottom of the page, you hit the back to site details page. And that will take you to uh, your site page and you'll have all of these little blue boxes or uh, blue tabs with different parameters. And then your data for the variable graph will be blank. And once you start transmitting, you'll start seeing some data there. So hopefully you have now six parameters listed on this page. If for some reason one of your parameters didn't work or it got out of order, you can go back and add it. The one the little quirk about this website is you can't change the order of the parameters on here. So if you really want water depth first and then conductivity, you can't do that without deleting everything and then starting back with the one that you want to put in the right order. So, um, <clears throat> or, uh, you know, if later you add turbidity and you want that at the top of your list, you can't, it's just going to be at the bottom of the list. So the order in which you've put these in here is what uh, the order in which they're going to have to stay. So there's no easy way to move these around. But you can just delete them totally and recreate them if you really need. So now you've got these parameters created on here. And every one of these parameters on your page, you're going to get a different, see this under, under the medium and sensor name, you've got a thing called UUID. And that's a gigantic, I don't know, 30 digit, 32 digit code or something. You have all those unique UUIDs for each one of the parameters. And that's what has to go in our Arduino sketch tomorrow that we will be using when we program the Mayfly. 
So in order to send, and everybody's got a unique code that the system has generated. So I would not want to show this on a video on the internet or anywhere else because the code that someone needs to send data to electrical conductivity for this sensor is now listed right here on this page. So that's kind of, you know, your top secret password that you don't want to give away. So when I go up here to the top and I click view UUID list, this little handy thing will give me the code. This is what gets pasted into our Arduino sketch tomorrow. So this is kind of the only hard part about tomorrow's episode is going to be copying this and putting it into an Arduino web, uh, window. So um, when we, uh, these codes right here, like I would not want to show this to anybody, especially on a YouTube video if we're recording this there, um, because these codes would allow somebody to transmit data and put it right in my database for these station, uh, for this particular station for these sensors. So. I'm going to be deleting this at the end of this workshop, so it's not going to exist anymore, but you wouldn't want to show anybody this list. So if you happen to have a problem with your code, you don't want to go to our Enviro DIY forum and post this, this chunk of code or anything that's got this in there on the forum, because then, not that it's a major problem, but if somebody really wanted to interfere with some uh, readings that somebody's doing, they, they now have the info that they need to do that. But these are the codes that you've got to have for your sketch to talk to the database tomorrow. So we'll be coming back to this site tomorrow. But for right now, that's about all that we need to do. If we go back to the, um, the Browse Sites button, um, I think most of you have probably already seen some of our monitor and model my watershed um, uh, workshops and presentations, or if not, you probably browse around enough to see what kind of, uh, visualization tools we have with the website. And right now it looks like because there's so much data going in there and lots of people using it, there are times where it kind of bogs down and gets kind of slow. So it's being really slow right now. So um, there it goes. There are times where you just can't access it at all for like five or 10 minutes. So there are, the data can usually still get through. It's just the website interface of things is uh, not always working right. But, um, so if you click on like one of Paul's stations up here in Cherry Creek and um, next to each graph, you'll see there's this um, there's a big tab up here that says time series analyst, or there's just this little um, button that says open in time series analyst. So I'm going to go here. And if we click on this, you'll see the reason we're going to all this trouble to send the data to the website is to have this handy tool for viewing time series data. And again, you're going to end up with over 2,000 points per day per station, and you can easily plot thousands and thousands of points all at once with this graph um, whenever it does load. Maybe it's going to load. There it goes. There we go. So I can see that on May 9th, the Stroudsburg area probably got a eh, nice little rain shower there, probably starting right around midnight or a little before midnight. And uh, the stream went up from 40, look on the left-hand axis, from 440 millimeters to 550 millimeters. So that looks like a really big jump, but it's only 10 centimeters or 100 millimeters. So that's only two and a half, three inches. But that's a nice little graph there on a fairly small stream. You can see what a three inch rise uh, of, uh, from rainfall will do. And that's a nice clean graph. So it shows that the sensor is working properly and everything's looking great. And if we want, that's from, uh, we can go back and look at the last, uh, yeah. So the website's being slow. So we'll stop with that for now. But 
Hey, Shannon, I just wanted to double check. Um, Michelle had a question about the elevation data. That's something you have to manually put in yourself, right? That doesn't auto- No, it, it automatically populates itself based off of the, uh, it should, if there's terrain data for that area, it will, it'll grab that. Like it, 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 it there is a, I think a, you know, Google Maps, you can put it in terrain mode and it kind of knows the approximate uh, uh, elevation of points and it will, it gets you pretty close. Uh, at Stroud, we know the elevation to some of our locations to within like fractions of a millimeter because we surveyed them really, really precisely years ago. And the map is, it's a meter or two off in a couple of places, but it's, it's usually based off of uh, like uh, a pretty uh, large grid uh, elevation model. So it doesn't get down to super fine detail. And it's really not necessary. I think it's just a feature that the, um, the people who made the site thought it'd be kind of fun to add in there. But you don't have to put elevation, but if, if it automatically pops up, it's just kind of a cool little thing there to kind of know what your elevation is, so. Okay, thank you. Yep. So that's all for the Monitor My Watershed site. Like I said, we, we sometimes give a half day workshop just on how to interact with this site. Uh, I know Dave Bretzer's given a lot of presentations and demos and workshops just on the data handling side of this work of uh, uh, just the monitor. But for what we're doing, building an Enviro DIY station, the hardest part is that creating all of the parameters and registering your site and getting the UUIDs so that tomorrow we can put that in the code. So now that we've done that, um, we're at a really good point for, um, for working on the, the code first thing in the morning tomorrow. So then, like we mentioned right before lunch, um, now that we've got the uh, this website ready to receive the data, we have to be able to transmit the data using our cell phone data plan. Um, so that's where we're gonna, and I don't know if we're gonna be able to do this entire step right now online because of how you guys are um, managing the data plans for this. So, but just to kind of give you an overview, I won't go into details on this, but I think I'm still sharing my Hologram, I mean, my, my desktop. So you can see, you go to hologram.io. Uh, it's not hologram.com, but it's .io, which stands for input output. Um, so you go up to the upper right-hand corner and you click on sign in. There's no, there's no uh, usually not a register button, I don't think on the, on the main page. Maybe there is, let's see. Um, yeah, it says start with the free SIM card and some data and how you don't want to do that because you've already got a SIM card. You don't want to sign up for a free one because then they send you a card and uh, it gets really convoluted and it's only like they only give you like a month of free data anyway or, and it's not even a full month. For, so what you need to do is go to sign in and on the login page will be a button down there that says uh, uh, sign up if you don't already have an account. For this part, for um, since some of you, I guess, are not going to be uh, Bob and uh, Zach and, and Tiffany who are not going to be activating this, then there's no reason for you to sign up on Hologram um, if Alex is going to take care of all of this. So, um, and then if Robert, you could do this if you're um, wanting to uh, do this on your own, but otherwise, yeah, Shane can do this part for you. Paul's already got one and Michelle's already got one. So most of what we are going to talk about here, you guys have already done or, or don't need to do. So uh, we can skip over a lot of stuff and just show you the high points, which is when you go to your hologram dashboard, you can see in my account, um, I have an organizational account so that multiple people can log into one. Um, you can see all of my active cards here. It shows you when they were last heard from, uh, how much data they used so far this month, and uh, whether or not they're online or not. There's one here that says connected and it's sending data. There's looks like they're all active and ready and doing stuff. So sometimes um, we've got a couple here. These are ones that we only turn on for testing and stuff. So if you are ready to activate a new device, if you don't have any on your list or for Michelle or those of you who already have one for Paul, he probably knows how to do this, um, but there's an activate send button up here and you just click on that and um, uh, 
do, do, yeah. So there's only one real type of plan you can use is the maker flexible plan. This is the part Dave was just asking, how much money do you put in your account? It costs 60 cents a month just to have the card. If you activate your card and then you don't put this station out for two months, it's gonna cost you a dollar and 20 cents, which is really not that bad in the grand scheme of things. Once you start using data, it's gonna cost 40 cents per megabyte. And that might sound like a lot of money, but it only uses, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact number. Um, we can actually go back and see how much one uses, but it, it really only uses about six or eight dollars worth of data a month. So the, it, it, this is not like a, your phone where you're downloading pictures. I mean, we're only sending very, very small text files every five minutes. So it's not like it's using a, a lot of data. You don't need a gigabyte plan or anything fancy like that. So this is just a kind of pay as you go. If you don't use any data at all, it's only gonna cost you 60 cents a month. If you're sending data every five minutes, it's gonna cost you no more than about $8 a month, sometimes even a little bit less. So um, it's really not uh, that expensive, which is the reason we're using this. If you go to Verizon and you say, I want a SIM card for some sort of online device, they're gonna to try to get you to activate a two year plan and do a credit check and give you a SIM card and add it to your like tablet or phone plan. And then you're gonna pay like $30 a month or something for eight gigabytes or some ridiculous thing. You don't wanna do that. We've had people who say, I took my Mayfly into to my local Verizon or AT&T store or T-Mobile and I went in and I said, I want a SIM card for this. And the people looked at me funny and said, well, I don't even know what that is. So don't do that. That's the reason we use these hologram cards. The hologram makes these cards for weird little homemade DIY devices like this. This is the, the the, the, the reason this kind of system exists. If you really want, you could put this hologram card in your cell phone and use it that way. Um, and it would cost you a lot because if you start adding up every time you download something or send an email, your megabytes are gonna go up. It's gonna, it's gonna cost a lot to do it that way. So, um, but for small little uh, internet of things, online data logger devices, this, uh, this is the type of plan that we would wanna use. So you just click select plan, you would type in the SIM card number. So for Alex, if you get to this point after you clicked on uh, adding this plan, if you've got three uh, cards, you can enter them all at the one time. You can type in a bunch of numbers, put a comma, and then the next bunch of numbers, and then the next bunch of numbers. So this is a really easy way to save you extra steps so you can do it all at once. So you just type in your numbers and hit add. Assuming you've entered it right, it will say, great. This is gonna warn me and say, these are invalid numbers. So if you type it in wrong, it's, it's gonna tell you. So it's very smart. Um, it all, you could also type in 19 random numbers and it's still not gonna guess. Like they know whether this uh, code has been associated with a card and sold yet or not. So uh, you can't accidentally activate the wrong card. Um, and then um, that's all I gotta do. So I can't go any further in this demo without actually having a real card. And if you get halfway through activating a card and stop, you actually tie up that card and it can't be reused again later. So I don't want to waste a card by going through this step unless I really want to activate something. So that's all I can show you with hologram. But on the next page is where it would you would enter your payment information. And if you've ever used some sort of prepaid card, you know what that system's like where you give it uh, like a credit card number. And um, every time some money is due, it takes that out. Or the easiest way is to put in $20 or $30 or something like that. If you know that it's gonna cost $8 a month and you wanna run it for a year, maybe put in $100 and that should cover you. And then um, once that money's in there, then um, every time, if you don't use your card for the first two months, it's only gonna take out that $1.20 and you'll still have uh, $98.80, right? So you can only put in as much as you think you're gonna use. If you really only wanna put, I think there's a minimum of $5 to get it started. So you might put in five or $10, make sure this is all gonna work, make sure you've got cell phone data at your location where you wanna use these. It would be a shame if you put $100 in your hologram account and then you found out that your, um, your, the location you're monitoring doesn't have uh, cell phone coverage and now you've got $100 in an account that you can't really get out. So start with a small number at first, make sure these things all work okay and then put in a little bit more money that will get you through. If you want to just put a little bit at a time, you can put in $20 and then when it gets to a certain point, they'll email you and say, hey, you're starting to run low on money. You should think about putting some more 
uh, money in the reservoir here so we can uh, deduct your five dollars a month or eight dollars a month whatever it comes out to be so that's that's a, a really good way of um, managing your your payment plans but what's really nice also about hologram is that it keeps track of um, the, the device activity so you know uh, when your device was last heard from and when it was um, uh, how much data you're using and what those costs are um, with each um, each one. So I think if you clicked on this, you would see. Uh, <clears throat> so Shannon, could you could you emphasize to everyone the, the importance of not letting the money run out? Yeah. So that's the thing on here. If you go to data plan, you can see I'm on a different data plan that was four dollars a month with a dollar per megabyte. So this was like a different plan and we probably need to change that because it would be uh, better savings, but it's not using that much. Um, if your account runs out, then your data stops. And so it will look just like someone stole your station or your battery died or something, but you will not get data on the online, you know, uh, monitor my watershed graph if the data stops. And when that happens, your data logger is going to be kind of confused because it's going to still be trying to send data, but there just will not be a, an active data plan on the card. And that causes your cell phone module to actually try a little bit harder. It stays online a little longer each time, hoping that maybe it'll get a connection and it will stress out your battery. So if you've got your station in a shady area that is... Um, uh, maybe you don't have full sun and uh, it's winter and there's not a lot of uh, sunshine to charge the battery with the solar panel, you'll end up uh, stressing your battery out and sometimes your battery will die just because you didn't have a, uh, an active data plan, but you don't know that your battery died because there was no plan to send data to the internet. So we've had people whose station went offline and then the battery died just because they did not have data in their uh, money in the data plan for the hologram account. So it's good to make sure that whoever's managing that account, whether it's you or someone at your agency, um, who's responsible for paying it, has signed up for that button that says either autofill when it gets down to $5 or less or you know, email me when it gets low. But they only give you like, you know, a 24 hour notice. They'll say, hey, your card's out of money. You got 24 hours to put more in or it goes off. And if you don't check your email regularly, your car, your station will go offline before you get a chance to uh, to figure that out. So just keep an eye on that. And like I said, if you if everything's working good after you put a little bit of money in and you know you're gonna run this thing for a year, it's a, a lot easier if you can just put in a hundred dollars and cover all the expenses for the next year. So that's the hologram. Your group here is a little easier since um, you're you've all half of you already have a hologram accounts and the other half are all gonna be managed by Alex. So that's gonna save us a little bit of time of trying to get everything there active. So it's great if you guys can get your cards active by tomorrow morning when we do this put together session where we're turning everything on and making sure that the data shows up on uh, the website. So um, you guys can work uh, to send data to Alex after we're done here and Michelle and, and um, Paul, if you guys can add your card to your existing accounts, that would be great. And if you need help with that, just either ask us on the forum or send us an email uh, and we can try to help you up before tomorrow morning. Any other quick questions about hologram? All right, I think everybody's got a good handle on that. I'm gonna give you the quick little tour of Did we do that in less than an hour? I was thinking, we did we start at 1 or 1.30? We started at 1, Shannon, and we're, we're a little ahead of schedule. Oh, we were, we were going to, your session was going to go until 2.30, and then we sort of just had 2.30 to 3 as open time to do that's whatever. So if you want to review Mayfly Anatomy right now. Yep, yeah, that's what I'd like to do. Um, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't running up against a 2.30 deadline here. No, I think all right. Good. So, yeah, we'll we'll keep the hologram stuff open in case anybody has a question later or um, uh, or after uh, the end of the session, or even first thing tomorrow morning. Let's let us know. So, um, 
since this has been kind of a boring hands-on workshop so far, we haven't actually done anything hands-on because it was all just getting um, laptops configured. Um, I wanted to give you guys at least something fun so that at the end of your first day, you can at least say, hey, we plugged it in and, and it works and I'm doing something with a circuit board. So, um, so I figured it'd be kind of fun to at least look at the Mayfly and turn it on and make sure everything's working. If for some reason this part doesn't work, we can't do the uh, first session first thing in the morning. So this gives us a good opportunity to troubleshoot uh, afterwards if we need to do any uh, extended screen sharing or uh, uh, installation work to get things installed on your computer to make sure this part works for tomorrow. So you should have in your packet of stuff I mailed you that uh, may fly uh, the back of the, or no, actually it was on its own page. There's a, um, the third page was that may fly um, features uh, kind of a little sheet. We're not going to go through all the letter A through S of all the little details on there. Some of our workshops, we actually use a bunch of different sensors. We connect things to the different ports on there. We do uh, all sorts of different activities with the, the Mayfly. And um, so we kind of refer to this graphic um, quite a bit in those workshops. But for you guys, we aren't going to do too much of that, but there's a few things that we need to know on there. And if you want, you can go ahead and grab your real Mayfly in real life so that we're not just looking at a static 2D picture. You can compare the Mayfly in real life to the one on the page. You'll see that it's, uh, we blew up the picture so that it's easier to read the numbers and the letters and stuff um, than on the real one. Um, one thing to note with the circuit board, if you turn it over, you'll notice the back side of the circuit board, if you've never really handled circuit boards all that much, um, you'll notice that uh, there's lots of little sharp silvery metal pins on the back. Um, that's where the parts from the top are soldered through and are connected on the back of the board. All of those metal pins do different things. Some of them are battery voltages, some of them are signal levels, some of them are grounds, some of them don't do anything. But there are, especially up in the corner where we connect the batteries and stuff, there are live voltages on there so that if you plug in a battery or your USB cable to your Mayfly and then you set your Mayfly down on something metal like a MacBook or if you've got water or coffee on your table or anything on the back that's going to connect the pins on the back of the Mayfly that's conductive, water or metal or whatever, you will blow up the Mayfly potentially blow up your battery and you know usually the laptops are smart enough that if they detect a short circuit or a surge on there they'll you'll get a pop-up on the corner of your computer screen that says this computer is detected an overload on the USB port and it deactivates the power going to that so be careful for those of you with Macs or anybody who may be working on a metal table or if you've got some coins or a paper clip or anything around do not put the Mayfly on anything um, that has any metal anywhere on it because you'll blow it up. So um, just try to keep that in mind. <clears throat> so uh, lay, uh, label A up there in the upper left hand corner, that's the micro USB jack that we use to connect the Mayfly to the laptop. That's the same type of little USB jack that's on uh, uh, some cell phones or other little USB devices. You can use your cell phone charger to actually power a Mayfly if you put it in your car if you really want it. You could use your sync cable from your phone if it's the right type of connector on there. It's a standard micro USB jack. So that's how we're gonna talk to the, uh, the Mayfly using your laptop. Letter B is the on-off switch for the Mayfly logger. Um, most data loggers that are out there do not have an on-off switch. And that's because it's too easy to be in the field installing stuff or cleaning sensors and to walk off and leave your sensor turned off. So usually when you connect a battery to a data logger, it starts recording. That's usually the way it works because it's too easy for either a malfunction of the on-off switch or to have uh, people forget to turn it back on if they've been working on it. And I'm guilty of doing that too. I've gone and driven to a station and worked on it and did some stuff, drove away and then checked the website and said, oh, I wonder why it's not online. And it's because I forgot to turn it on when I left. So I got to drive back and then flip it back on. So, but because we use these data logger kits as workshop example kits and doing various things, we needed to have that on off switch. So it's just something to be aware of if you're putting the station out, 
the last thing you do before you walk away from your data logger is to make sure the on off switch is on. Over there labeled Q on the right hand side, um, it's kind of hard to see, it looks kind of like an O, but it's really a Q, kind of towards the middle. There's some little red lights, there's a red light and a green light, there's another couple of lights on the board too. Um, when you're in the field, there's no point in having a bunch of lights on on a box that's got a door closed on it because you're just wasting power turning lights on. So when you walk away from the data logger in the field, there's usually no visual indicator on the board telling you that it's on other than the on off switch. So you just have to kind of double check that each time. Um, <clears throat> letter C is a jack that we're going to be connecting the uh, card reader to. We're going to work on that in the morning. There's a little small board that came in your bag of components that plugs in there that allows, actually I'll show you a picture here. It's a little board looks like that. That's actually the older version, but it's, it's a small board and it says micro SD and on the back side, it's got these little eight little uh, gold pins. And you can see it plugs into the Mayfly that allows you to put your memory card in vertically rather than using the horizontal May, uh, memory card socket that's in the center of the Mayfly board. And the reason we do that is because if you haven't already guessed, we're gonna be putting this Mayfly inside a Pelican case and it's too hard to get the memory card out of the big gigantic silver sideways uh, socket. So we invented a vertical micro SD card socket that allows you to grab the card so that when it's inside your, um, your full station, it's easy to get. That vertical card adapter is the exact same pins and everything as the sideways one. You can either use the vertical or the sideways one if you've got like the Mayfly just sitting on a desk. They do the exact same thing, but you can't use both at the same time. You have to pick one or the other. So um, it just gives us the option of accessing the memory card from two different angles. You don't have to plug that in right now. That's not necessary for what we're doing here in just a little bit. It's just something for tomorrow morning to let you know. That little chip or that little adapter, that green thing that's in your bag, that's the vertical card adapter. It is somewhat fragile. You don't want to, the reason it's, it's not connected um, is because you don't want to pull on it or pry on it because it will break off, especially in shipping. If you put a bunch of stuff in there and beat the box up around, uh, all the components is like the way I shipped you that stuff, it would have broken it off and snapped it off the little pins. So we only connect that at the last moment when we're assembling the station. So keep that off for now or it will break. A um, couple other things we'll need to know tomorrow. Um, there's some other adapters and things that you plug in, but we're gonna skip all of those. But if you look here on the board uh, at the bottom, there's these, Big white rectangular jacks, there's six of them. They're labeled G, H, and I on this diagram. And those are called Grove connectors. And um, we designed this board so that it has these six sockets on it because there's a whole bunch of Grove cables you can buy. This, this picture here is Grove cables that have four, uh, like just broken out pins on there. You can plug it into anything you want. Or you can buy sensors. There's a, this is a magnetic tilt uh, or magnetic switch sensor that we use in some of our workshop demos. So they sell this handy little cable, which you probably recognize. You've got two of them in your kits already. And um, there are hundreds of little small blue or green uh, bo breakout boards for different types of sensors. So it allows you to use your Mayfly with a, uh, a wide variety of uh, sensors and adapters and uh, devices that have been designed with this same little matching connector. So the connector is polarized so you can't put it in backwards. So that way the power and ground pins are always in the same spot and you can't accidentally short something out by plugging it in the wrong way. So uh, you've got an adapter that we'll talk about tomorrow that connects to your CTD sensor um, that connects using that Grove cable. So you'll be plugging it into one of those little white jacks on the bottom of your Mayfly. The other thing that we're going to do tomorrow is to plug in a watch battery to this little silver jack because this is a data logger and it's not going to work right if it doesn't know what the date and time is. So in order for the data logger to retain that date and time, um, you want to put this little battery in and it will keep the clock alive for several years. Um, in the case of you removing any other power source to the Mayfly, you don't want it to forget what time it is. Um, so tomorrow we'll be putting the watch battery in, but it only goes one way. If you put it upside down, you'll blow something up. So we've got to put it in 
like that, the way it's shown in the photo with the plus side and the, the words up. So tomorrow we'll do that. Don't do that now because there's no point in doing that. Um, and then up in the upper right hand corner, there's these three little smaller white plastic jacks. One is labeled N as in November and the other two are M as in Mike. Um, the two M jacks, that's the LiPo batteries. It's the lithium polymer battery. And you probably, if you haven't already seen it, you, in your box of parts, there was a little cardboard box that um, uh, if you didn't open it already, that contains the little blue battery pack. And that has a special polarized uh, cable on there. And that's what powers your Mayfly board. It can go in either one of those jacks, either the one labeled M or the one labeled M. They're both exactly the same. And there's a reason why we do two, because like in this case, on this photo, the battery is connected to the middle jack. And there's a small red and black uh, jumper cable type thing that connects between the little red cell phone board and the other jack on, this, on the right. Because we need to power the Mayfly using the, the main battery. And the little jumper wire there is just uh, basically um, is, is kind of a splitter almost. It takes the power from the battery and also shares it with the cellular module. These cell modules use so much power, they can't draw the power directly from the Mayfly. They have to connect directly to the lithium battery. So we do that by plugging the battery into one of the middle, the, the, either the middle or the bottom jack, putting the cell phone thing on the other jack. And then the upper right-hand corner, you'll see the word solar written next to that jack. That's where the solar panel goes. And it's also a small red and black uh, cable with the same little white jack. So you've got three cables that all look very much the same, but they all do very different things. So this is a little bit of like just kind of um, uh, one of the details you got to keep track of that if you plug in the solar panel to the battery jack and the battery in the solar panel jack, it's not going to work and it might actually damage part of your board. So you don't want to do that. So just try to, um, don't plug anything in until tomorrow when we go through this step. And then once you see how it goes, it'll probably all make sense. And next to those white jacks on the bottom of the board, you'll see they're labeled D10 and 11, D67, D45. I, they each have a unique purpose because they're each connected to certain pins on the Mayfly board and they're not all the same. So when we go to connect our CTD sensor, it's going to go on one of those white jacks, but it can only go on one. If you plug it on any of the other five, your sensor is not going to work and your data logger is not going to notice that it's plugged in. So when we get to that point tomorrow, I'm going to say plug your sensor into a specific jack. So you just have to look at those labels right next to the jacks and make sure you're using the right one or it's not going to work. And I believe that's all that I have on the Mayfly hardware tour. Does anybody have any questions? about just general questions or statements about their Mayfly, if you were looking at it, uh, wondering what it does or uh, what to touch, what not to touch, or is there anything unusual about your board or your box of parts that you think may have something may have broken or you didn't get something or you're missing something that was not on your sheet? Can you hear me? I have a question. Um, is there any way where we can keep track? Like, is there an app that we can download on our phones? For what? To keep track with the data or no? Um, it's like to keep track with the hologram data cost or are you talking about just viewing your station data for um, monitor my watershed? Yeah, um, just monitoring, view, like just that general data, not the hologram right not cell phone data but the sensor data yes yeah um no the um uh monitor my watershed is a website so there's not an actual app for it yet i believe that's in the plans if somebody had a lot of money and they want to develop a uh an app for it then we could but i think just developing apps takes so much time and money and and um effort especially multiple platforms and all that that um there's other data uh, priorities with the data system that we would do. So for now, you can go to monitor my watershed with your phone web browser 
Um, and it's a little bit clunky because not all the maps work properly. Sometimes it works better if you turn your, your phone sideways because then the menus work a little better. So um, you can view all of it on your phone, but it's not quite as user friendly as on a computer, uh, on a website. I think it's much easier on a tablet if you've got a bigger tablet screen, but yeah, unfortunately there is no like easy to use monitor my watershed app for the sensor data just yet, but maybe someday. Okay. And this is Thank Rob you. Um, Oh, yeah, Bob is asking a question. He's holding up the, uh, what, what's this black thing that he was holding up? Yeah, that was something that um, I guess Zach pointed out that when he took a picture of all the parts, was what is that weird looking pulse black flexible thing with a wire on it? That's the antenna for the 4G board. So no. um, we'll be connecting that to the 4G board tomorrow. You don't want to do it now because the little connector that's on there is really fragile. It only wants to be connected about three or four times. If you do it, if you put it on, take it off and just do it on and off and on and off, after three or four tries, it's no longer gonna work and you end up having to throw it out and buying a new one. It's only a six dollar antenna, it's not a big deal. But there's also two jacks on your cell phone board and you don't want to put it in the wrong one and have to remove it and use one of those uh, connections to, uh, to put it back in the right spot. So tomorrow I'll explain where to plug in that little uh, thing, but that, that flexible thing is the antenna. And I believe that also the other thing that was not in the photograph was that small red and black uh, four inch cable that's got the little matching white connectors on the end. This is the power cable that goes from that extra LiPo jack on the Mayfly to your cell phone adapter. Um, and um, we'll be talking more about that too. I didn't show a picture of that cell phone adapter board, but you'll, you'll see that again tomorrow. So, um, but yeah, as long as you guys, I put that, um, if you didn't already find that flexible antenna, I put that inside the Pelican case when I shipped everything because I didn't want it to get damaged. It, it could get bent or, or beat up um, if you just throw it in anywhere else in the package. So I put it inside the Pelican case on top of the foam to uh, kind of protect it in shipping. But everything else should have been in the um, either the white box with the battery and then all the Mayfly kit was in there. And then I put all of the more hardware components. Um, well, I guess one of the things that you, uh, we didn't talk about what it is, but you might have already guessed there's a, red cable, it's 18 inches, uh, or well, probably 22 inches altogether. Um, this is the solar panel extension cable. Um, I believe that's in the photograph. So we'll um, talk about that. Again, this is something that you've got to do the right way or um, you can't easily, if you push it into your uh, Pelican case uh, cable glands, um, it's very hard to get it back out. So we only want to do this once tomorrow or we'll end up having to get it out, break out some special tools to Put it in the right way. So don't don't do anything with this till tomorrow uh, when we do that portion. Also, um, Shannon, I believe Rob Tuttle had a question. All right. Yeah, this question is um, it, it related to the Jack uh, I the I to C Grove port connector. Yep. And um, so, how long can these uh, this I to C bus be how many can it be feet i mean you have a cable here that's you know six inches or so yeah um they sell i've got a one inch cable um they usually come actually they're metric so it's a it's a four centimeter five centimeter cable and then they make a um this is a 20 centimeter cable they make a 50 centimeter so it's a couple you know a foot and a half long and then um you can get longer cables. The problem with, if you, I guess you probably already know this, but for anybody else, the longer you increase a cable length, the uh, more resistance you got in your cable. So if you hook up a, uh, like let's say the, the sensor here, the, the, there's two data lines, a power and a ground, and that's what powers the sensor. The power line here is supposed to be 3.3 volts. If you uh, have a really, really long cable, and you measure the voltage here, it'll be 3.3, but on the other end of that cable, it might be 3.2 or 3.1 or 3.0. Um, so depending on the length of your cable, you're gonna get a voltage drop over that. And then the data that comes back is also a voltage on that cable. And if your sensor isn't strong enough to send uh, a, a, a level of a signal that's gonna make it back to the logger, you'll end up, you know, it's like having someone too far away and you're shouting at them and maybe they can hear you, but you know, it's just, it's right on the edge of of being able to have a communication. 
And so then you got to think about, well, they're going to repeat back to you what that you just said at that level or, with, you know, and then you're just going to lose too much in the transfer. So depending on the type of signal that you're using, the type of sensor you're using, there are limitations. Um, I don't know what they are for that particular bus or for most of our sensors. Um, we're using the, the CTD sensors we're using are, are using a protocol called STI-12 and uh, the voltage levels are slightly different and the COM uh, protocols are different. But we use uh, 30 feet, um, and I guess you've already seen on the sensor you've got, your cables are 30 feet long. So um, you're not gonna have a problem talking over 30 feet with those. So it's not too big of a deal. Um, I have used sensors with STI-12 that had a 200 foot cable on them. I think some of them are rated up to a thousand feet. So again, it just depends on the type of protocol you're using and the type of sensors they are and whether or not they're using a method that's um, appropriate for for that. I mean, there's also a current measuring, it's a, a four to 20 milliamp where you actually send a current so that the voltage drop doesn't matter because if you send four amps out of a cable, it's still gonna come, it, it's got, it's a loop, it's, it's gotta come back at the, same, at the same current level. So there's other things you can do if you are talking over long distance, but for anything that I can imagine that we would do or anybody else would do, you're fine with 15, 20, 30 feet or something like that for most of these type of sensors before you would kind of need to kind of take that into consideration, so. So the STI-12, if you had um, maybe 10 feet, something like that, you wanted to have a sensor out on, the, you know, 10 feet away from the, um, from the Mayfly board? Yeah, 10 feet is no problem. I've, I've done 15, 60, and like I said, even 100 or 200 feet. So it's, it's not a problem. As long as you're using good high quality cable and the sensors um, is rated to, to handle that sort of uh, thing, it's, it's not a problem. Uh, now that would be with STI-12, but the I, I to C would, wouldn't, wouldn't I, I don't know. I see. I haven't used that one that much it, it, because and that's something we'll get into either tomorrow or when we talk about other sensors later is that we try to use professional grade sensors for almost all of our research grade, um, re, uh, sure. our, our, of our environmental research. Um, so we pay, spend $500,000 for a sensor um, that almost all commercial sensors that we use have either uh, um, some sort of uh, you know, I2, or excuse me, the, the STI-12, or some of them have a, uh, like an analog signal that we use with those. But um, the I squared C stuff is, it's more of a proprietary thing. Not everybody uses it. it it's, um, uh, it's, it's harder to find in um, most commercial uh, environmental sensors that we're using. So we just haven't had to use it all that much, so. Well, thank you, Shannon. That, yeah. that, that does answer my question. All right. Um, yeah, does anybody else have any other questions just mainly about the, the Mayfly board? Or tomorrow we'll kind of go through all of the um, the bigger details of but speaking of cables, I did do a a uh, calculation the other day when I was going through zip ties and stuff and wondering why I've bought so many zip ties over the years. Um, with 300 stations, um, about 500, we've, we've used about 500 sensors between those 300 stations um, because not all of them have two and some of them have three and four sensors and some only have one and so, but an average of, we've used about 500 sensors with uh, 30 feet of wire on them each usually. So that's uh, 15,000 feet of wires, which is like three miles. So I've secured over three miles of cable um, to river banks and data logger poles and under the water and whatever else. So um, that's why I, when I was going through and wondering why I'm always buying these thousand pack of zip ties um, because we've gone through an awful lot of uh, cables over the years securing things. So when we, uh, when we get to, if you guys ever do a workshop with us on installation tips and tricks and all that, um, you, you kind of learn a lot after installing three miles of cables 30 feet at a time. So um, and same thing with these data loggers. After we put out hundreds of these things, we what we're going to be showing you in tomorrow's workshop is not the only way to do it. It's just what I found to be the easiest way to do things without having to go back and redo it again later or to have to replace your board because the box leaked or something blew up or your sensor washed out in a storm or something. So we're just kind of showing you what we find as being um, the easiest method, but it's not the only way to do it. It's just the method that seems to be the most successful for what we do. So we kind of started Enviro DIY five, six years ago with that in mind of just showing what we do. We didn't really set out to be 
board manufacturer and a distributor of all this stuff and a, and a leading teacher on this material. It was just kind of, we were doing lots and lots of uh, deployments and kind of keeping uh, records of all the neat things that we were doing and building interesting devices and all. And then people started asking more and more questions. So we developed a website to answer those questions. And now it's kind of turned into uh, this whole Enviro DIY platform. Um, and now with this, the workshop we're doing today and tomorrow, um, it is a little bit specific to this uh, CTD sensor and the Mayfly and sending it to our data portal. But we're trying to do this in a generic enough method um, to, you know, it's like teaching somebody how to bake a cake. You know, you can say, hey, use this box, uh, the box cake mix, put it in a pan and stick it in the oven. And I'm not going to tell you anything else about how to cook. Um, when you're done, sure, you made a really cool cake, but you don't know how to make brownies and you don't know how to make uh, muffins and you don't know how to make a strawberry cake instead of chocolate that was pre-made. So we don't want to just give you a box that you turn on and a button that you push and everything works magically. The idea with this uh, program is we're giving you lots of education and tips and so that later on, if you want to add the sensor or build one of these on your own or change something somehow or um, just make five more of these without our help. We're trying to give you, uh, you know, the tools to do this on your own and to learn a little bit so that you can add to it in, in your own way next time. So um, if we really wanted to make it easy, we would have just built the whole thing and sent it to you and said, here's the on off switch, have fun. But we were trying to make this, you know, a learning thing so that you're empowered to learn how to do this on your own. And that's what's been really fun about Enviro DIY is that we sell uh, hundreds of mayflies all over the world and then uh, we don't have to ex instruct everybody on exactly what to do because they can figure it out on their own or with a little bit of lead from us and they kind of start with that and then take it in a new direction and do it their own way and add stuff to it so it's been a really fun uh, you know a uh, couple of years here watching how things have developed into that so when things like today and tomorrow seem a little bit difficult and you're like wow this folks at Stroud could have made this easier by doing some of this for me then that takes away why we're teaching you how to do this yourself. So we're hoping that all of this um, will lead you to being able to feel more confident in making your own station next time or adding to this station or at least understanding how this thing works so that when you go out to retrieve your data card and something's not quite right or something's going on, you you know what's going on, you know a little bit more about it. You're not just you're not just an owner of the thing, you're you're taking care of it and you're uh, helping maintain it and you're understanding the operation and that'll help you with the data side of things too when you are analyzing things if you have a better handle on how this thing is functioning uh, it'll help you interpret that data so that's kind of the reason why we're you know making you guys go a little bit extra uh, in some of these steps to, to learn how to do this so I hope that that will uh, um, yeah, give you all a good good point to, uh, to be able to work from by the time uh, tomorrow's workshop is over yeah, I think you did an excellent job today, Shannon, walking everyone through the process. I think it went smoothly and we're right on track. Fantastic. Yep. Um, Rachel and I were chatting um, just now about just kind of some wrap up stuff. Um, we wanted to emphasize that uh, in preparation tomor for tomorrow, um, the folks who have monitoring kits really just make sure that you've got those six variables um, all set up on monitor. Um, so that's uh, Bob, Rob, Tiffany, Zach, Paul, and Michelle de Blasio. Um, and it would also be good if, if those folks who do have them, if we could do the, uh, the plugging it in and watching the lights come on here in just a minute too. Um, I forgot that we wanted to do that. It only take a second, but yeah, for those of you who have a Mayfly and your USB port handy, I'd like to uh, plug that in here before we go. Good. So let's do that. And the, the one other thing that uh, we wanted to emphasize for tomorrow was just make sure that all of you come with your kits, with your complete kits and your CTD sensors. And if at all possible, you know, as Shannon mentioned, have your um, SIM cards activated. Okay, uh, so Shannon, if you want to do that quick right. uh, instruction on the Mayfly. Yeah, I guess, I guess I'm still sharing my screen. I forgot I was yep, sharing. You so, um, you'll see on my desktop I had that Arduino program. I closed it earlier. 
if you already left it open, don't click on it again because if you open, you can actually open up two or three or four versions of this and it will cause all sorts of headaches because you won't know which one is, they'll fight with each other while they're open. So if you already left one open, you know, down in your toolbar, you might have the thing, basically, um, you want to make sure that there's not more than uh, one instance of Arduino running uh, on your computer. Um, <clears throat> this is that sketch window. We're going to talk more about what this sketch means. We're not actually going to program your Mayfly. Your Mayflies were programmed ahead of time. You have a sketch on them that is the, the sketch I program every single one after I've tested them. I give them like a little uh, kind of hello sketch type thing before we send them off to Amazon or to you guys. So this is uh, the, the, um, the sketch that you will see when you first program a Mayfly. So we're not programming anything, it's not gonna forget anything. And so what, what it's doing today, it will still do tomorrow. If you put this thing on a shelf and you come back 10 years from now, it's gonna say the exact same thing. This Mayfly will always do whatever it's programmed with the last time. So, um, so we should all be able to see when we plug it in. So you can um, plug your USB cable into your Mayfly and then plug the other end into your laptop. And probably nothing will happen assuming your Mayfly is turned off. So it's, make sure your Mayfly is not on anything conductive, no metal or paper clips or water or coffee or anything like that. And then turn on your Mayfly. And in my case, I've already installed the drivers. But you'll, you'll hear Windows will make a noise usually um, indicating that a new device has been plugged in. And you might get like a little pop-up in the bottom right that says Windows is installing drivers for FT232RL or something like that. There will be a, um, or FTDI232, there will be a little prompt telling you that Windows is doing something. For those of you with Macs, it will also install the stuff automatically, and I don't think you can get a pop-up there. But you, with all the newer Windows machines, you should not have to actually tell it what you just plugged in. I'm just kind of rambling because you got to give it like a 30 seconds or a minute or so to make sure that it has found those drivers. So once it'll usually say adding it and then you'll get another pop-up that says Windows has added this device. So um, if, if it's done that, when you go to your Arduino window and you know there's five menus at the top, file, edit, sketch, and tools. You know, on the tools menu, earlier we went down to board and we went to board manager and you, you know we've Hopefully you've all selected that the Enviro DIY board is, is listed under boards. And then you should see a thing right under that that says port, and it'll say COM5 or COM2 or 3 probably in your case if you've never installed anything like this before, maybe COM4. You can tell I've already plugged in. Usually one and two are reserved for other things. So three is usually the first free one. So this is the third uh, Mayfly that I've plugged in. Um, so, Yours may say COM3. If it doesn't say anything at all, if it's just gray, then your computer has not recognized your COM port Mayfly yet, and we're gonna have to work with you to make sure your drivers are installed. So this is the part that, um, if everybody who's got a Mayfly is able to do this step, then tomorrow morning will be great. If for some reason you're not getting a, something popping up on the COM port there, we're gonna to have to work with you before we can do your um, session in the morning. And for those of you on Mac, it's not gonna say COM, it's gonna say device something something rather. I think Paul might, might know what it says. So can uh, the folks with kits chime in and just confirm that you're getting that COM? I'm not getting it, but I am getting uh, a red, and green light flashing back and forth on the board. Yeah, you'll get that, but what, what we need to do is, like, like I said, because you're on a Mac, it's gonna look different. I'm not sure what it's called. But as long as you've gone down and selected COM3 or whatever it is, make sure there's a check mark by it or device name on your Macs. What we're gonna do now is, we're, to, to make sure, this will really tell us whether or not you've got it added, is we're gonna see what the Mayfly is doing. So I programmed the Mayfly to talk back to a computer if it's connected. I also programmed it to blink a red and, and, and uh, green lights. 
So if you click on up in the upper right hand corner of your Mayfly window, there's a little magnifying glass kind of icon and it says serial monitor. And um, if you click on that, that is the monitor that you use to view the serial communication between your laptop and your Mayfly. So if you click on that, you'll get a window that pops open. And you're probably going to get a bunch of like random characters on the screen that don't look usable. The reason for that is devices can talk to computers at all different speeds. And you got to make sure your device and your computer are talking and listening at the exact same speeds. The default for the, window, for the uh, Arduino program is down in the bottom right hand corner of this COM5 or COM3 window that you're looking at. It will say 9600 BOD, B-A-U-D. That's the BOD rate or the speed at which the communication is happening. The Mayfly is actually talking a lot faster than that. So you're going to click on that window and you're going to go through that list and we're going to choose 57600. So 57600 is the baud rate that the Mayfly is speaking to the computer. And once you get the computer listening at the right rate, then you're actually able to decode the words properly on the screen. So if you see on my screen, it's telling me it's a blink demo with serial temperature and it's 25.5 degrees in my kitchen right now. So hopefully everybody has been able to get their COM port going. Make sure your Mayfly is turned on too. If your Mayfly isn't, power switch isn't on, it's not gonna work. Shannon, it looks like some are having the COM um, come up on their computers. Yep. And some are not. Yeah, if you don't see if you don't see any device to select in your COM port, then Windows does not recognize what you've connected. And we're gonna have to try to figure that out. It could be you don't have administrative privileges or you don't have Windows updates. You have to have your com computer configured so that if it, because your computer doesn't know what a Mayfly board is and what this chip is that it goes in between. And so it has to go to the Windows update, which is the online place where it gets those drivers. So you got to go through and manually tell it where to get those drivers if you don't have it automatically set up. And Zach, the baud rate is 57600. So it looks like Levi's working because he told me it was 21 degrees there. He's a lot colder. Um, Paul's probably got his going because he's got his serial selected properly. Rob's got his going. All right, we're doing good. Michelle, Michelle think she's looking up. All right, so Zach's going good. So I guess Tiffany is the only one that doesn't have, and that's probably, Tiffany, you're using a PC, right? Or Mac? I'm using a PC. Okay. I It's actually blinking. I didn't know how to turn it on. Okay. So I got it on. All right. So once it's on, after Windows has found it, um, like I said, back in the Windows XP days, it was a real pain to get this thing to work because you had to go through and tell it all the drivers. Windows 10 is great about the drivers, assuming you're an administrator, um, and Macs are really good about drivers also. So they re usually recognize this as soon as you plug it in. So Shannon, can you demo that again, finding a calm spot for Tiffany? Yeah, once, it, assuming Windows has done its thing, when you go to Tools, uh, about two thirds of the way down the list, it'll say port. And uh, if there's nothing there, if it's just gray and you don't have any choices, then Windows doesn't see a COM port. Sometimes it will automatically select the COM port that you've plugged in, but sometimes you actually have to go in and manually click a check there if it's in the list. But if there's nothing in the list, then Windows doesn't see it. And it's not an Arduino program or problem, it's a, uh, a Windows problem. So um, there's ways to handle that. And yeah, Zach had to select that serial port. Each one of those serial ports, they'll have a unique like coded name like that. It'll be a USB serial and then like a whole bunch of like random codes. And that's unique to the actual chip on the board. If you plug in a different Mayfly, it's going to have a totally different those eight digit kind of coding number. Um, so that if I plug in a new Mayfly, it's going to assign this as COM6 and then a third Mayfly will be COM7. And then if I go back to my original one, it's going to say, oh, I recognize you, you're COM5. So there's actually a serial number embedded in each one of these uh, Mayflies that comes through when you connect to that serial port um, that's in this little um, 
chip here. So that's part of the issue is that getting Windows to shake hands with that properly. <clears throat> but once we assume that all of this is working for all everybody, when they're able to get that, if, if you're seeing this stuff on the screen, um, then uh, your Mayfly is going to work fine for talking to your laptop. There's still the last little hiccup of making sure all your libraries are in the right place so that your laptop can talk back to the Mayfly tomorrow when it comes time to program. But for now, this is a really good step. And you've at least got a, a, a green circuit board on your desk with blinking lights. Um, I'll hold mine up to the screen in case anybody's wondering what it looks like. It doesn't have a Mayfly, but it's a, um, there's two small um, LEDs on the board. Most data loggers or most Arduino boards don't even come with multicolored lights. Some of them have like one yellow light or something like that. I put a red light and a green light on there so that your Mayfly can tell you if it's having trouble. The red light will come on. If everything's good, the green light will come on. Um, and so we actually, uh, in this sketch, I just told my board alternate between red and green every two seconds and spit out the temperature. So it's just kind of a fun little sketch that allows people to see if their board is working um, when they buy it off of Amazon or get their board somehow. Um, it's just a nice fun way to get a little bit of a response when you first plug it in to let you know things are working great. Um, we are at three o'clock. So um, in the interest of just kind of sticking with our basic workshop um, agenda and timeline, yep. um, why don't we, um, if, if there's no other immediate questions, why don't we just uh, close the workshop for today? And um, Bob, you can stay on and uh, we'll get your situation um, dealt with. And then um, everyone else, let's just meet back up tomorrow, maybe 9.50 or so, if everyone can start logging in around 950 so that we can start right at 10 today. Um, that will be great. Just use the A2 Zoom link that was included in the agenda and included in that last email I sent. And um, we'll just uh, proceed with the rest of the workshop. Make sure to bring your kits and your CTD sensors. Yep. And um, yeah, it's the big thing is that we need, we definitely, we're going to be starting with the CTD sensor and a bunch of the components that come in the, uh, in that kit. So you need everything that was in your box and your sensor uh, handy for the very first step tomorrow. Great. Um, all right. Well, uh, if anyone has any additional questions, they can stay on. Uh, Bob Major, stay on, please, for a few more minutes. And Shannon and Rachel and I will um, help you. And everyone else, we'll see you tomorrow.